hope you're all coming tomorrow night, grad students. Is it going to be recorded? It will be recorded. Will you, will can be. I have access to it? You need to register to get the recording as okay. of right now. Okay, so I will do that. If you do not have it, I can send an email to all of us if you guys want to register. Oh, for we've it. got the inside scoop. Did you? Yeah. I actually have like my first like outing in a while tomorrow. So I'm gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be tricky. So like, like personal, like you going out or like well, work? Well, um, so my, I was a part of a leadership um, program in my city and so uh, in 2019 and so they have like a fun each year there's a program and then they do like a fundraiser okay. and so it's this year's classes fundraiser and a bunch of my classmates are going oh, nice. um, so it's in person and there's like some drinks and hors d'oeuvres and so it's like it feels like I should probably put on like real clothes yep. <laughs> yeah. so yeah it's it's a big one yeah. <laughs> Speaking of real clothes, I had my annual review for work. And one of the things on it was dresses professionally for work. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I've been working from home since the pandemic. I mean, from waist up, I've been professional. Waist down, uh, a little tricky there, you know. And some, some of the things I've seen waist up on camera, I'm like, no, people, like you're still at work. Like you have to look like you tried today. <laughs> so, yoga pants has become my best friend yeah. this year. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. We Eric, a, how are you feeling? Uh, I have a fan on me, so if it's too loud, just let me know and I'll shut it off. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but. No, not at all. Like I'm on fumes. I'm, oh. I'm down in my Gatorade. And, uh, Good, I have not taken my Tylenol yet, but um, I'm trying to hold out on that a little bit, but so. My boys got it yesterday, their first one. They get Pfizer? They got Pfizer, yeah, because it's the one that's approved. So my, my boys are 15 um, and we went to Rensselaer Field, so the airfield, so you like drive through. Yeah. Um, and it was, it, it felt very much like out of a movie. So, um, you know, there's National Guard everywhere and they come and they shut you in. And, um, but I have one who was, amazing and didn't flinch and the other one is a nervous nelly it was kind of a hot mess they made him get out of the car to do it and they Aww. like had him hold on to the car and at the end of it all this lovely nurse i mean she actually graduated from goodwin like that's how long we were together because he was so nervous um he did this he goes i love you i love you i oh can't wait to see God. you again and i was like <laughs> that's great mortified so I hope you didn't like blow a kiss at the nurse <laughs> oh my god I know I want to get my 13 year old one but he's like your son where when he got the flu shot and his um HPV shot he literally passed out oh and yeah, yeah. and I mean my my 13 year old is like 5 11 and a half yeah and he plays football and everything else and when it got time for the shot he literally passed out. His nine-year-old sister's laughing at him like, ah, you know, you big chicken. And so when I said something to him about, oh, I got to schedule you your COVID shot. He was like, I don't need a COVID shot. I just won't go anywhere. And I'm like, you can't do that. Yeah, Rory was, um, so my kids are twins, as you guys all know, in this cohort. Um, and, and I love them. I love them for both of who they are. But Rory was filming Logan. Aww. And we like, and Logan, you know, was, I mean, he was, a, he was a hot mess. And we get to the waiting, you know, the 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, Logan says, if you share that with anyone, I'm coming for you. Like, it was like dead. And he's like, all right. So he deleted it. But it was, it was comical as a family. So, Eric, I hope you feel better. Thank you very much. You guys are great. Uh, now you know what I went through last week. And I still got it. Yep. You, you were very straight out. So you're still feeling it? Oh, uh, let's just say it's breaking up now. Holy smokes. Well, what oh. happened, I, the, I got my shot last week, Wednesday, but I was coming down with something on Tuesday. The only thing the shot did was just amplified it. So I ended up with bronchitis, ear oh. infection, allergies, and it was like a triple whammy. And I was in bed for five days. I didn't bother going to work. That's how messed up I was. And I'm on six prescriptions. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's a lot. 
My second, so, that was really bad too. Well, every year I get bronchitis. That's a given. It, it's just the way I do it. Every year I always get that. But the shot, I didn't feel nothing from the shot. The shot just amplified oh. all the other things. Yeah. And if you look at it, I had three people at work because I went in Sunday to try to tough it out. I had three people tell me, and I hate to say it like this, they, they said, Sal, you crap, go home. I look like grim death, they said. So oh. if I were you, drink your fluids and lay low. That's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, Joanna, what did you end up with a shot? Did you get um, Pfizer? I, I got Pfizer. The second, the first one, I was okay. I just felt, you know, my, my arm was kind of sore. Uh, but then the second one was two weeks ago. I got it on Saturday afternoon. Sunday, I was a mess. I looked like a zombie walking. <laughs> Everything hurt, like my bones, my joints. I couldn't like, I couldn't walk. Like everything, I was so miserable that day. And then at night, I got a little bit of fever temperature. Um, and then I started getting like the chills and stuff like that. Um, so Monday, I went to work, you know. I I told them that I got the, the second doses and all that, but I didn't just want to tell them. I actually want them to see me, <laughs> you know, how bad because you know, the people, you know, calling out and whatever. So I'm like, no, they, I stayed that day. And then the next day they were like, no, Joanna, just don't come on Tuesday. So I didn't go to work, but it was really bad. The second shot, like bad. <laughs> and then I got, you know, like, um, the lymphatic, um, like I got swollen. it like, it was really swollen. That was on a Wednesday. So I got it on Saturday and on Wednesday, I start feeling like, not numbness, but kind of like a hot flushes on my fingers. Yeah. And then I call my aunt, right? Because she she works at the hospital and she's being hurt. You know, a lot of like um side effects and stuff like that. So she's like, okay. I call her like, like I'm feeling this. Is have you heard this? And she's like, you know what? Just go to the bathroom and check your, you know. And I'm like, okay, I went to the bathroom and I was like, so swollen here I got so scared like but then you know went to the walking clinic and uh, so maybe you know for them to give me something because of the pain but they say it takes maybe like from one to two weeks to go away so I still oh. have a little bit swollen but you know it will go away yeah so that's why they say you know for women not to do the um, mammogram exam and stuff like that because yeah so but wow. yeah I had Moderna, but my second one, I had fatigue really bad. Okay. And I had fatigue for like almost two weeks. But the first one I had, like my arm was very sore. And you know, they put it in the arm that's your less dominant arm. But because with the second one, because I had my sensor, because I have to change my sensor out every two weeks. So I put it in my non-dominant arm. So they put the second shot in my dominant arm, I didn't have any soreness or anything in my arm. So I don't know if it was because I used that arm a lot, but the fatigue, I had fatigue for like two weeks. And, um, and but then did you guys sign up to do the V-safe to check in with your symptoms and stuff? Oh. Yeah, they um they should have given you a <laughs> no. I, yeah, when you sign up, they should have when you got your shot, they should have gave given you a sheet, which is through the CDC, which is called V Safe. And what they do is for like the first couple of weeks every day, they'll send you a link for you to check in with your symptoms and anything like that, and they track you for like I think eighteen months up to two years. Oh with your symptoms and everything. So basically you just report your symptoms. And I guess if it's anything that's crazy or is prolonging, they'll reach out to you. But it's called V-Safe and it's through the CDC. They just told me to call the number on the back of the car, you know, just mm -hmm. to report, you know, any symptoms and stuff like that. But, and then I got a text message. Yep, um, that's the V-Safe. Asking yep. me if, oh. Then yes, I that's it, that's the V-Safe. <laughs> oh yeah. So, with all the good stories you guys just shared, that I'll sleep with one eye open tonight. Clear, right? <laughs> <laughs> Have a hot toddy, you'll be fine. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yes. But you guys don't know what I mixed it with my Gatorade, so. Um, there you go. No judgment. Um, 
So uh, tonight, I don't know if anybody has kind of read through chapter two, but so tonight, like the key goals from the chapter for the module for this particular week is to talk about our data needs, to um, come up with formulas for recommendations, to figure out how we can find recommendations, to understand organizations' uh, needs versus desires. And by that, I mean, um, we just don't look at what Bezos and Amazon's doing if we have a, you know, a shoestring budget of $3,000 to spend on data collection. So, and we wanna, our goal for the chapter is to identify the three uses that an organization has for data. So it's kind of the 30,000 foot over you. We're gonna drill down into that tonight. Um, first question, anybody still having IT issues? Cynthia, I saw your, um, your um, ticket to uh, Canvas support. Eric, I know I'm not going crazy because I <laughs> sat up there and clicked every single thing that night. And then what was I shut down earlier that day and I said, I'm going to go back and do it. Um, and I went back and done and I was clicking on every little thing and it did not work. And so it was funny when I hit the next button and I was like, oh, it worked. Here we go. And when I went back in to log in to respond and I was like, I didn't do that. And yeah, but it worked the other day, last night, I think it was. And I was like, but I did, I hit everything. I don't know, but it's working. I'm there fine. Were, there were still some fields that they were modifying in my shell this past week. Um, okay. I think uh, Rebecca might've had one of the, she couldn't access some things. Joanna, have you been able to access everything? Since they uh, modified it, and we couldn't get the we couldn't get the text last week. We couldn't access the um, the data strategy book. You're muted. You're muted, Joanna. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking, talking, and talking to myself. Hold on. Oh my God, what am I never doing? You can keep talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me okay. just open everything again. Anybody else having trouble accessing anything in the show? Uh, oh. I, haven't, I haven't dived into uh, week two yet, uh, but I did order the book at uh, Best Buy for 25 bucks. So I, I want to buy it and. I did go ahead and buy the book too, just because I wasn't going to print it every time. And like, if it was going to limit me on the number of pages and stuff. So. Yeah. I should be getting it sometime by the end of the week that Best Buy said. I think it's a year for paperbacks, like $25. $25. Best Buy? No, uh, Barnes and Nobles. I'm sorry, not Best oh, Buy. Oh, Barnes and Noble. Yeah. I got it off like, Amazon and it was like. Was like hey, Amazon. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, you didn't go to Amazon? Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the exact name of it again? A lot of other book, data books. It's Data Strategy by Bernard Marr. Thank you. Sorry, I just was being lazy. I realized as I asked. <laughs> I could have looked it up. Oh. Hannah, you were able, were you able to print out the whole thing? I know we were talking about it. You weren't capped at like 40 pages? No, I printed, so I, I didn't mean to, um, but the first week it printed all at Goodwin. Um, and then I actually got the book from, from Mackenzie. She gave me her book. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I probably have the printed one somewhere in my office if someone needs, I mean, I can send it to you, but it, it let me print, but I don't know if it let me print because it was the first time I was in, right? Like, cause sometimes those limit how many times you can even go in and print. So I, I don't know, but it did let me print. I will be honest. Um, I forgot it at the office and I read it, read it in the book this week. I like the printed copy better just for my notes, but that's because I'm a nerd. Do you put it loose? <laughs> do, you, do you put it loose leaf? Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't, I mean, it's, it's- I'm like a hundred years old over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, any, if anybody's having IT issues, just let me know because they've been very responsive, but it's also, we are the guinea pigs with, uh, with the new learning management system in Canvas. 
So um, there are still kinks that are working out of it. Like uh, Hannah texted me or emailed me on, was it Monday, Hannah? She's like, where's week two? I'm like, um, should be populated automatically. That's the way it worked in Blackboard at like 4 a.m. It would populate automatically. So then I don't know if they're working off of like, you know, Island Pacific time or what, but it's definitely not happening at 4 a.m. So I went in and manually overrode it. So um, thank you. You're welcome. I, I did, you, did you manually override it for Sundays? <laughs> That's me, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to actually go in no, on Sunday mornings. No, seriously, I will, because I know for us, you know, it's one of the days that we can get a lot of things done. So, um, so I don't mind doing that at all. Um, Eric, I have um, one question with the grades. Um, when I went, because I just check in there casually, when I went in, it has an old, it has like a missing from like a January date. You know how like some of that old stuff was still in? I don't know if it's, I'm not overly worried, but I just wanted to call it out. I don't know if it was anyone else's. Like it looks like something from the old module popped in and, and populated yeah, I, in mind. I think there's four assignments in there right now that have, that were uh, when they copied the shell. Because okay. we, we use the online uh, class as the model. So they have two discussions every week because they don't have an actual lecture. Oh, okay. So I went in there and wiped out everything, but there's four items I can't clear because they're part of the competencies. So, but they're not going to factor in because they have no grades okay. associated with it. So oh, okay. Okay. aesthetically it's ugly, but it's, okay. it's not going to affect you academically. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, do you why, guys want to talk about um, our discussion board and how much you dislike Amazon now? Or <laughs> I don't love know. Canvas for the discussion board, but that's only because I'm just getting used to it. No, I said the I same agree. thing because it was much easier Sorry, to Eric. use the old threads when it was like separated threads per yeah. person and just one big list of everyone's info. Yeah, it's definitely more, it, it's tougher to follow a thread in Canvas than it is in Blackboard. Um, believe it or not, I'm saying a nice thing about Blackboard, but um, it, it will, I think it will get easier. And I'm asking IT if there's a way in which they can set that up where it can, or, or distant learning actually, Derek and distant, distant learning is kind of the sensei with, um, with all of the Canvas stuff right now. But if we can kind of break those down, but it's, I will tell you as tough as it is for you to respond, it's like tougher for me. You can get your violins out now. It's tougher for me to try to separate the content to see, okay, yeah, here's good two good responses and 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 you guys seem to feed off each other. So it's it gets like where there's just like um, just blobs of of correspondence, which is great because that's the whole point of them. So but again, it's it's an LMS and it's not going to it's not going to hurt us. It's just um, you know we have to make the best of that particular thing right now um, and just keep focusing on the content. So, um, so you 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 right now you don't like it better than Blackboard? Um, no, Steve, I I do I like it better if I wasn't teaching in it. I would tell you I loved it um, because I see all of the things that it does that Blackboard can't do, especially from, you know, for leaving a message, for um, creating, a, creating a segment for a class and so forth. But um, it's kind of like, you know, if you get a new car, you get so excited about the new car. It's like six months later, you realize, hey, I didn't really, you know, these buttons did this or I never tried this. So, um, like I'm just not super comfortable in it yet because we've only had it for a few weeks before we started the class. So we could only do these training modules called Sandbox, which we did, they're all simulated. So it's not like, it's not real world. Like when Cynthia tries to post and it's not there, you know, we don't practice for that. We practice for, this is how you put a post in, you know, it's like, like schoolhouse rock for canvas. So, so I do like, you, I, you guys will like it better, I promise. Uh, I'm really not looking forward to September. Right, because your whole class is going to be on it. All your classes will be on it. But you'll have you'll have the summer 
to get like the other side under your belt. I think, I mean, it, it's not rocket science. That's what I'm learning. It's just very tedious to try to figure out how they do it differently than Blackboard does it. And supposedly it will be more user friendly, but, um, and by user more for the student than for uh, faculty and staff, but you know, we'll see. At the end of the day, it serves its purpose, but you know, it's kind of clunky. We'll, we'll figure it out. And I think if you didn't have Blackboard to judge against, you would probably be, you know, you wouldn't know what you don't know. So my, my okay. sister last summer, their grad school program um, went from Blackboard to Canvas. And she said after she got used to it, she ended up actually liking Canvas better. So Ooh. I'm, I'm going to give it the adjustment period and see if I agree with her. I think you will. And you have a small sample for Blackboard. She did her undergrad in Blackboard. So, yeah, that's true. so she was really tied to it where you've yeah. got a couple of, you've got a semester behind you with yep. that. So I, I do think you guys will end up liking it. Um, but again, it's a learning management system. It's going to keep a, it's a repository for all of our academic pieces. So um, anyway. Eric, can I, can, I ask, can I ask this quick question? So sure. I, I will take one for the team on week two. Um, do, you, do you, and we didn't ask this to you last week. So when, when will you typically grade or do you wait sort of like a following week or should Kate and I not go in and refresh our screens on a regular basis on oh, Tuesday? I was going to um, say, I like how you said you're taking one for the team, but it's really you <laughs> needing to know so that you don't go crazy. It's Love it, Kate and Hannah. Hannah. <laughs> but but uh -huh. Eric, I, honestly, right, it's, it's the first week. So, and, and as soon as you mentioned, I mean, I will say, as soon as you mentioned you as our teacher having to go read that discussion board, I was like, oh God, like, if he grades those by the end of the semester, like I'm good because right th there's so much to read. And, and we are, I think, an over overzealous group. Like we respond to probably more than less. Um, so you know, just just curious. Well, Sandy will will tell you. She, uh, Sandy will confirm this, but I like to have my so I I want to have your assignment that you submitted back to you within a week. That's my goal. So okay. Okay. And discussion boards, I like to have them done. Uh, you know, I, I'll read all of the initial posts, usually by the end of the weekend, so I can go in and just check the responses because, and another kind of an aside that Hannah asked me last week, um, and I changed some of the, some of the um, script, but um, a lot of the templates for the discussion boards said, post an APA formatting, which is, you know, no pronouns, um, citations. I'd like to get you in the habit of citations. This is kind of like, um, you know, practice round to just get comfortable with cit citing. But um, to have true discussion and it's opinion based, you're really not being able to stick to APA formatting. So if you see APA formatting in a discussion board, just kind of dust it, blow it off. I'm going to try to correct all of the, the rhetoric that says that, but it really kind of prohibits, if you're trying to stick to structure, you're taking away from content, you know? So, so uh, that was a good point, but I will typically, if I can get, if I get the, everything on, I upload it and it's weird how it uploads for an assignment in, um, in Canvas. So uh, I've had three formats and I can tell you right now, Cynthia, do you use a Chromebook? Do you use Google for? Yes, I use Google Chrome, yes. So um, like I had, a, I had a Google, or I had, I'm sorry, I had, the, I had a, a Chrome formatted. Um, I had a PDF. I had two words, um, but they, they don't come in uniform like they would in Blackboard. So, um, and I have to make sure my browser can read those. So that, that's why Canvas is a little more. ticket for that one. Oh, I'm telling <laughs> that you. That sounds like a nightmare for you guys. Does uh, it be submitting then in PDF? Does that make more just, sense because it locks the format or no? It, it doesn't. Um, it really doesn't. Uh, whatever is easier for you, it's not hard for me because I've uploaded all of those. I, my browser will now open each format. 
but the um, uh, I think it was um, oh, it was Caroline that emailed me today because when she submitted, it looked like it was just like the formatting was wiped out when she when she uploaded. And I emailed her. I'm like, no, nah, it looks great. You know, your formatting's right, is spot on. It didn't change anything. You're still space, uh, one and a half space, 12 point New Times Roman. So, um, yeah, there's a uh, some type of synchronicity issue with Canvas with certain browsers. So, um, but everything that's been submitted is fine. So do what you're doing. That's we. I have the capability to open it all the first time. When I uploaded it to the folder, it looked like like a demo pack that they upload on your computer with all the different programs. So um, so anyway, a week out on the assignments. So I don't want to keep you on pins and needles and the discussion boards. Ideally, um, like and not to make an excuse, if I wasn't <clears throat> if I didn't get my shot today, I probably would have done them before work this morning. You know, so. Uh, because I've already looked at the main, the main thread, and I just look at the responses now. And again, just to make sure, uh, you know, uh, great post, Kate. You're awesome. That's all we do. It. You know, those are those are the killers. We want the the challenges. So, uh, so is that good? I don't know what uh, Bridget did, or I know Sandy's kind of backed up, but uh, I just it's. You put all that time and energy into it the least i can do is get it back to you so you can see what needs to be modified especially if you want to do a rewrite or if you want to you know change something is everybody comfortable with apa formatting anybody not comfortable with it you had just said this may just be me but you had just said 1.5 and i feel like i've been double spacing and maybe that's, that's my own me. issue that I, just um, wasn't paying attention. I did the same thing. Okay. I think I'm probably doing the same thing as well. Is it? Well, you just said that my eyes were like, oh, <laughs> I didn't do that right. So. You know, I, I think Maria, I think, I think um, APA seven is one and a half. And I think all the previous um, APA versions were two. So it's not kicking out on my machine and I'm not getting out my micrometer to measure the, uh, <laughs> The I figure the content probably makes more sense in the spacing, but just to make sure I have the paper length correct. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, and and just keep in mind too. Again, we get, I know we want to make sure it's APA formatted. When you submit an assignment uh, attached to your portfolio, it's going to need to be an APA formatting. But um, I, I I will say that the um, I'm going to let you know when it's a Kind of if you have a few of a series of you know days and and um, you know things that we could easily you know slide in a noun, but it's going to sound redundant. Um, I'll, I'll make note of that, but I'm not going to go through the whole paper and say, okay, you lost 12 points for for grammar because this is a theory based program, so. Unlike, you know, in Steven's program, you get it right or you get it wrong. But you, if you can back up your hypothesis with, uh, with evidence that you create, then what's to say your theory's not better than, and, and I, I think you will see if you read the case study, all of your theories are probably going to be stronger than the theory, the hypothesis of Richard Schultz, or um, uh, George, Schultz, uh, George Schultz had. Howard, why can't I remember? He's such a vanilla guy. <laughs> like just you know um but yeah so and what are the answers at first i was like I, I think i misread key is three and i was like oh, okay there's three of them and then i was like oh i guess it could be multiple or not so yeah i was curious to see if we all came up with the same responses or if there really are right answers or if it's like well as long as you pontificated well enough it, it's rebecca it's like it, you're you could really get into the uh, psychological weeds and pull things out. Um, you could interpret things. So there's not a concrete answer of, there were three strategic goals that Schultz had going into this, but. Um, but according but, to my paper, he did. <laughs> you're giving him a lot of credit. Okay. Uh, because what this is going to do with this, what this first paper is going to do by identifying the key strategic goals when you're looking at your final and putting that together with your team, 
you guys are going to throw your goals together and see where they align and where there might be some discrepancies and build that into your presentation because there's a segment this week's particular assignment is how we talk about like data collection data needs um, we're going to address that as you know we get to throw ourselves back into the time machine and go back to the to the uh, Schultz boardroom and just say you know you know Howard if we did this this might come out differently so um, but all this is really helping you build your case for your final. So you're going to see along the way the different steps. So we get to the beta framework, which is where you kind of, that's kind of like where, um, you know, if you're watching one of the cooking channel shows, this is where they start the timer and throw all the ingredients at you and say, okay, you got 17 minutes to make this. So that's what we want. You know, each week you're going to put a little more um, thought into it and you're going to take it from a different perspective. I think in week six, maybe we talk about Tivana's perspective because we always look at Starbucks because they're the big players that throw all the money at it. But we look at, you know, Tivana who culturally put this together as a way in which they can kind of change the culture of the American tea drinker to kind of align more with the Asian and European tea drinkers where it's much more of a relaxing and, you know, it's, it's not designed to go to the window, swipe your card, get your coffee, hit, you know, and then the manager at the store looks at the delivery times, you know, of each customer. It's not like that. So it takes a long time to brew tea when it's done correctly. So anyway, um, let's shift to, uh, let's shift to Amazon and how the recommendation system, and I'm just interested to see what, you know, you thought of the recommendation. We, we all use it, you know, obviously we've all used it or we're all aware of it prior to this class. But what are some, what are some of the thoughts that you had based on uh, your conversations with colleagues? So I'll say from my perspective, just cause I felt like, and this is again, I continue to talk about how great I think it is with this cohort model, because I think when I was, putting together my post, I was looking at it from a very kind of um, pointed lens. And when I wrote my post, that's what I was thinking. And then all of a sudden I read Kate's post, I think it was, and she had commented on mine about how even within the lens that I was looking at, I wasn't actually looking at it fully, it, which I think is just an interesting thing to think about that I was thinking of totally new products. When in reality, if even if I'm looking for one particular product, it's still recommending certain brands or certain, you know, ratings or certain prices for me. So I think it was just interesting to open up my own perspective about how I looked at the recommend the recommendations. Did you feel violated at all? Yes, totally. I think every time, but now, I mean, I knew it before, like when I would talk about something and it would pop up on my phone or anything like that, but it's like, you don't, now my wheels are really turning every <laughs> single time something pops up. So it's funny. As a sociology major who studied a lot of like media stuff, I mean that, you know, so much of that was about like the media and how they, you know, manipulate your decisions, you know, whether it's the news or, you know, who's reporting it and that kind of stuff. So I, I guess I would pride myself on being enough of a critical consumer that like, I try not to fall into like the most obvious trap. Like, you know, I talked about, you know, I see the Amazon picks and I'm like, no, I think I'm going to like do my own research. So I try to not go like be total putty in their hands, but yeah, again, it doesn't mean they're not getting tons of data off of me and that kind of thing. Um, I had mentioned how I discovered this not too long ago. <clears throat> the, uh, they must have a partnership with Buzzfeed because Buzzfeed has had so many, you know, like Facebook articles or whatever about like the top 25 on things on Amazon that have like over a million five-star reviews. Um, and so it's just these really simple things that you're like, why would I not want to add that? You know, it's like $10, $15, $20 everyday items. And it's like, yeah, they're all like super practical. And, you know, so if you're like, yeah, I could just go for, you know, a little impulse buy, a little pick me up that shows up in the mail in two days, that's a really great list to look at. So those ones totally get me. Um, I always felt like my sister was kind of a I couldn't believe how much she fell for all the Facebook things of like, oh, fill this out and we'll tell you what kind of person you are, 
you know, and it's not like a personality thing. It's just a data mining thing. And you're like, oh my gosh, like you are really full, of, you know, hook, line and sinker. So Rebecca, I was fascinated because I think I posted and then Caroline posted about mine or I read hers vice versa. And she said, you know, I always read the reviews. Like I'm always reading them. You know, I want to see what people are what they start. And then, and then I think a couple of, 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 of us in the cohort. So I, I don't ever read the reviews. I'm like, I don't know. I need a, I need a nightlight. I'm going to buy That's a nightlight. That's really interesting. But then I was interested to see how many, like, cause I, I asked Caroline, Caroline this and I was like, do you then write a review? And she's like, no, no, no. So I totally don't. I'm a total who's writing these reviews then is what I want. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Cause I actually just got on a, um, I think it's Shein or it's S H E I N. It's like a super cheap oh, fashion yeah. site. And one of my students was on into it and I was like, Oh, I'll check it out. And so they have like a thing where they will give you points for every like amount of feedback that you give. And I thought that was brilliant because it was just like, if you tell us, you know, like your height and weight and the sizes that you ordered, you know, which I like to look at that because I want to know, you know, how it fit for somebody who's my body type. And so they're like, you know, giving, rewarding people for adding that additional detail to their review. And, um, and you don't have to, but every little section that you continue to go gives you a little bit more. Wow. Well, yeah. Like so with Amazon, what happens is it's not Amazon, but it's the manufacturer or whatever. They will, if you do, I haven't done a review, but if you do a review, they'll give you like maybe so many dollars towards off your next purchase or whatever. So I have come across that because they've offered that to me, but I just don't want to write a review. Okay. <laughs> I pass. Yeah. I don't have time to take a picture and write how I liked it or didn't like it or whatever else so yeah but I read the reviews I look at all the photos as I said in my post that I like to see what it looks like right yeah. and um like so for example I bought this top and um and you know and I saw like there were photos of women that were like my size I was like oh yes it's a cute top I'm gonna get it I got it home it came and I tried it on and it did not work <laughs> whatsoever. I was like, no, it's going back. But I do. I love the reviews. I look at the photos. I look at the stars, the, the ratings and everything. I and must find the right things because, you, right? So, I mean, I'm buying like a, I, like a nightlight. Like I, I, like I literally bought a nightlight the other day because it went out and I was lazy. I acknowledge that. And I didn't want to go to the store to buy it. But like reading everyone else books, like you're all like, you're clearly buying way better things than I am. Like, I'm not, it's like buying like a wrench or a thing. I was, I didn't know what it was. Like I'm buying nightlights and like batteries. So maybe I need to up my, like maybe Amazon's not recommending things for me because I'm not buying good stuff. Hannah, I bought a squeegee the other day, <laughs> like a squeegee. And I researched because I wanted just the right squeegee for my window. And I researched, I think I admitted it in one of the posts. Like that's what, so I go in for pointed things. And so I felt like I had one up on Amazon because like, I don't just peruse, like I go in with a purpose. I do use, and I'm a lazy shopper. So I use the star ratings where it has to have a, like thousands of ratings and, and good stars. So it could have like five stars, but if it's only five ratings, no. So it's like that quick rating. I don't read as many reviews, but I have to give Elise the credit. Because I, I think I said it in my comment to her. I left class Wednesday night feeling very like big brothery, like, holy crap, they like watch every move I make. But Elise, I forget how you said it, Elise, like pulled the curtain back or whatever. And essentially like recognizing like sort of in some little way, like the simplicity of it, of like just what they're trying to do. And like really just like we mm -hmm. do in some ways benefit from all this insanity. Like, so don't they. But like we benefit from it as well because they do know what to suggest and like they it's a lot of leading but if you're lazy like i am and don't like love online shopping then everything's right there on the first or second page for me and i don't have to do that much so i i have to give you credit at least because it did make me pause and be like oh yeah i guess it's not well, as like creepy as i made it out today <laughs> Well, I always thought I was like, they're listening. They just know yeah. they're in my head. And then it was like, oh, they're tracking on my clicks. These other people who bought these same things, they're mm -hmm. buying the same things. Of course, this is what they're going to recommend for me. Yeah. But the one thing that I still am 
a little bit um mm, is so what came first the chicken or the egg did they get all these reviews and then that's how it's the highest one and amazon recommended it or did amazon recommend it first and then it got all the reviews mm, that's interesting well, i just googled how many amazon reviews are real and don't I, tell me there don't is some stuff that. out there about there being some fake reviews and obviously yeah. anybody <sighs> can create their own fake reviews i don't know if amazon has its own like conspiracy to boost all of them but but yeah, but also so many people are on it. And so when they say like, you know, only maybe 15 to 20% of people actually write reviews, well, there's still a shit ton of people, sorry, um, because no. of how many people use Amazon. So even though there's a ton of people that don't write it, that's still enough to inform a decision. Yeah. That's true. I'm going to well, write a review before the end of this class. I'm going to buy something, take it up, right? Because, because I, yeah, I set different goals, happens. set different I'm goals for goal. yourself. How is I'm that? Gonna buy, like, I'm going to buy like pens. I'm going to buy like big pens, some like cheesy, uh, you know what? I should write a review for every binder I buy for these classes. Cause I buy the same one, just different color, but that, because no, because right. Cause Eric, I now want to know what happens, right? Cause I'm not reading the reviews, nor am I writing a review. So what happens to me as the consumer, like, does, does my Amazon look change? Like, am I, I don't know, do I have like a top badge like in Facebook or something like I, like best binder reviewer? I don't know, I'm gonna do it. It's gonna be my one personal thing. So Hannah, you wanna see something funny you talk about? So I bought something that was recommended or suggested by, and I've had it for like, I was like, I saw it, I had to have it. It's been sitting on my desk for like three months. And so this thing is like to take dust like off the car, the keyboard, the vent, and it's like a putty, and it got oh, like yeah. it got like high ratings and everything. It hasn't made it to my car yet, and that was the reason why I bought it because it gets into the vents and and, and it is it's like putty, and it got like crazy ratings, and it was like maybe seven dollars, and yeah. Now I think I now got to take it to the car because now I got to use it because like I said I've had it for like three months and have not used it at all. It it still has the um, it's you see it still has the thing. <laughs> but like Anna, do you use it for work? Like, do you go? I mean, because your post fascinated me. Like, do you go and yeah. like, do you use it for work? Like, are you like I maybe I can get a better price on Amazon because I need this thing? So you talking about the rent set? Yeah. Um, so I ordered that for personal use at the house. Uh, basically, I had been bringing crates from my employer back to the house and they use a star bit. So I don't know if any of you know, it's you got the Phillips head, the flat head, and then there's a star end, which we didn't have. So I just said, you know what, I'll get a kit that has all three heads. And then that way we can take apart the crates if we have to. Like, do you know more about Amazon than you're letting on in this class? Because your posts were very, like, in-depth and, like, um, smart. I don't know. Like, I, I've been using it for a while. I do have Prime. Yeah, so me it's too. Just, it's just easy to get anything. Hey, we're buying <laughs> squeegees and binders. Like. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I didn't, th I didn't think of that. Okay, go on. <laughs> okay. I wonder if uh, they frown upon Sal using... Um, Amazon when he when he's at Walmart. Oh yeah. Yeah, Sal. Do they know yeah. you're there? Listen, I'm all about saving money <laughs> and kind of drop it into eBay now. But I, yeah, I know. Okay, here's the thing. I collect weird stuff. I collect the oddball stuff. I I collect swords like for a show, like from old series, old movies and stuff. And I saw a couple on eBay, and I'm getting those notifications now because they go through my browser history. And I was, here's a notification for a sword or, or bowling ball because I love bowling. So here, here's a we got a deal going on for you. But listen, it's all about saving money. Walmart is not the best at saving money. If I see something that I want and it's, and it's an oddball thing, I don't care. I I got two credit cards with Amazon. I got the eBay credit card with them. So if not, I'm whacking it the card to buy what I want. <laughs> just don't have I it like delivered that. to work yeah oh no i would do it if i was leaving and i was really want to be spiteful i would do that just to be uh a pain in the butt so i, need, I do at amazon and ebay now so i do what i do take it to the man sal <laughs> of course i'm the little i'm the peon here i gotta i gotta save money where it counts um 
All right. So I think we kind of beat up on Bezos and that in Amazon enough tonight, but it, it's really to make you aware of um, how they're collecting, like these big conglomerates are collecting data on us and how what we might think is insignificant data, like the purchase of, uh, you know, star or um, like uh, star bit heads or hex heads, or, you know, now I'm sure that um, even that while we're talking about it, I will have probably something from Stanley pop up in my feed because my Siri probably picked up on that. But so anyway, how anything that we say or that we search is something that they benefit from because data brokers are going to grab that information and then literally sell it at the speed of light uh, in batch and other organizations that are looking for these keywords, pull it up and then solicit us. So, um, and it's very similar pre Amazon when, um, was, you know, go back to when we were kids, um, and going through the grocery store and have all the impulse purchases between the, um, the aisles. That's where, you know, while, while we're, uh, our parents or whoever are loading up the, uh, the conveyor belt, we're looking at, you know, the gum, the magazines, the candy like bars. That. They were trying to control <laughs> us then. It worked. It definitely worked. Um, and now, and, if, and that was, you know, it really started at the grocery store and it expanded out to, you know, you can even get it at like um, at the hardware store, um, things that aren't necessarily in the aisle, but that are just like, you know, hey, I need one of those like a uh, small tape measure or something. But so anyway, and that kind of ties into a writing assignment last week, which was to identify the strategic goals that, you know, what, what, what kind of data were they looking to collect? You know, what, what, were, what, were, what were they going to benefit from this purchase? Um, you know, you all set goals when you want to do something. So how strong were uh, Howard's goals going into this? And did he actually, I don't want to be a spoiler, but, you know, did, would he have support of the board? Were there, were there, was everybody on board? Was his uh, data scientists uh, on board? So those are some of the things as you research a little bit more, you'll see that, um, there's a lot of like rogue activity going on during this transaction, but it was a lot of massaging and ego. So, um, but you, you know, it's kind of like you, you, you can see it coming and nobody really wants to get out of the way of it. So, um, if you ever hear the book or the story, the emperor has no clothes, um, very similar where nobody wants to tell Howard, Hey buddy, I'm out. Let's take a look at this. That's your assignment this week is you have that opportunity to say, uh, you might want to save a few hundred million dollars by doing this. So, um, so then anyway, that's this week's writing assignment uh, coming up, but the um, letting them know ties in with last week's of what were they looking to do. Uh, from our teams now, I've gotten everybody. So I'm um, just, just confirm for me. And I'm just going to do this in the old fraternity Greek alphabet that I'm familiar with. So our alpha team is Cynthia, Stephen, and Anand, right? Anand, that's, those are, that's one team. Uh, beta would be Hannah, Kate, and Maria. Is that right? Yep. Our kappa team is Joanna, Marianne, and Elise. Let's say we'll, we'll go with a yes and no. We haven't had a no. And our Delta team is Rebecca, Sal, and Caroline. Right? We all good with that? Yep. Got the head nod from Elise for good. Marie, you had something? No, nope, I just said yep. All good here. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is the point where we can get the popcorn out. We're going to start talking about the, um, our data needs and how to start a data strategy, how to build a data strategy. Um, so we can do it a couple of ways. And I, I think most of us are working for smaller organizations, correct? By smaller, I'd say like, you know, 
500 employees, you know, and down, right? Is that about, is that accurate? And, I, my college is a little bit bigger, but I would say probably within the. Okay. I mean, and, and I'm just kind of getting a ballpark because I'd rather deal in something in this size where it relates more to what we're doing currently in our first, uh, professional lives than if um, then we deal all night with uh, Amazon who, you know, their, their data department is bigger than, you know, probably the, uh, the state of Connecticut's budget. So, which isn't saying a lot, but um, so anyway, so the first thing you want to make sure when you're um, putting your data strategy together is you need to identify a specific need. So can somebody give me that, uh, an example of a specific need to, a, to put a data strategy together? Revenue. Revenue. We want to make more money. That's a, definitely a specific need. What's another specific need that we have? Repeat business. Okay, exactly. So we want to get customers back. Uh, let's go one more. One more. So we have money. We want to make money. We want to get customers to come back. What's a third? Retain, retain individuals. Retain customers. Retain students. Retain retention of anything. Very good, and that's a good one because we can look at that from both uh, from a revenue standpoint by retaining customers and from an operations standpoint about retaining um, personnel. Um, so Simon Sinek, I'm not sure if you folks watched any of his TED Talks, but the guy's awesome. And he has come up with a segment of his TED Talk before, which I put in, I think you can link it in the notes tonight. I know you can't because I actually clicked on it earlier, um, is begin with the why. So why, why are you doing it? Why are you collecting this data? Why do you want to get more customers? Why do you want to make more money? You know, it may be because you need to make more money because, you know, you had such a dismal fiscal 2020 or 2021 due to the pandemic. So you need to begin with the why as to why you're doing it. Uh, and if you use the crossword puzzle mentality, um, you don't focus on one piece of a crossword puzzle. You focus on, you know, you might dump the box out and start looking for the end pieces so you can build your frame, but, or you might just start sorting by kind of color schemes so you can start putting sections together, but you don't focus on one piece. So when you, when you're putting your, your strategy together, you're looking at it holistically, but you're identifying specific goals that you want to attain. And you want to make sure that they're goals that you want to attain and they're not goals that you think your competitor wants to attain. So we'll go with, we'll go with a uh, good one. Because Hannah, you're like, you're the Alice right now on my Brady Bunch screen. So you're like right in the middle. Um, so a good one, we put our, we put our goals together based on what is in the best interest for our students because we're a career focused institution. Um, we would not go across the river and look at Trinity and say, okay, well, this is what they're doing. So let's, let's align with this because we're in the same industry. Um, or let's go to Capital across the river and see what Capital's doing. Um, for their nursing program. We don't do that. We, we create an individual set of goals in which to collect data that we know will benefit our students. So even though we're in the same industry, we're looking at things completely different through completely different lenses because uh, like even Rebecca School out in Iowa, um, we're not, it's, it's, we're both colleges, but you know, her model and our model are maybe similar but we don't have, we can't just sit there and mimic somebody else because we're, it's, it's not an industry, industry driven decision. It's designed on how we create our strategy of how we're going to best serve our needs. And I think, I think you're gonna have me for 650 again, uh, which is strategic planning in uh, a couple of semesters, uh, or I think it's the end of next semester actually. So you do 640 next, 
and I think he do 660, then 650. So, um, and we've really focused on, on building uh, an ad, active strategic plan, which means, uh, well, if I have a static strategic plan, what typically happens if it's static? Gets outdated and it's not growing with the needs. Correct. It sits. Um, it's it's one of those checkbox mentalities where, hey, we did our strategic plan. Let's put it on the shelf. Let's look at it again in four years. Um, if we have an active strategic plan where every month maybe we're looking and reassessing um, is the data that we collected in January of 2017, four years ago, going to be as valuable as the data we collected maybe in January of 2021 that we're looking at it right now in May of 2021 because we didn't, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a Nostradamus in the group, but nobody saw a pandemic coming, right? So all the data that we could have collected back then for a static strategic plan would sit on the shelf and we'd say, why didn't we make our goal? You know, why didn't we hit that number? You know, we thought we mapped it all out. We had our strategy. Oh, well, we had a pandemic. So that's why you need to, to run these uh, scenarios live and you need to challenge the organization internally. If you do that through the collection of data where you can identify different trends, you can identify, you don't need to be as, you know, a, a rocket scientist to determine that um, in the educational industry, enrollment traditionally went down during a pandemic. It's because, well, schools are closed. So you don't, you know, you don't need to have to graduate cum laude with a math degree to figure out that enrollment's down because students couldn't go to school. So there's your, there's your, your parallel uh, study where you don't need to really spend a lot of time on it, where if you didn't have data to support that there was a pandemic and you were looking at straight numbers, you would not know why the numbers went down. So, um, I, and I, I think there was an interesting study done recently where um, the amount of cases that in, um, in Amish country, the amount of cases because um, these folks don't get the newspaper, they don't have social media, they don't have any type of digital media, they mostly don't have televisions. So they weren't affected by the emotional hype. Um, and if they were asymptomatic, they weren't going to get tested or checked or so forth. But the, but the numbers uh, supported like they gave Pennsylvania a kind of a boost because their numbers were their, no, their numbers were low to kind of offset higher the numbers that were higher in the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh areas. So, but um, again, uh, the, the I guess the point of that story was that the folks that were not aware of a pandemic happening um, were business as usual. Where the states looking at that particular piece of of the basically of generating commerce and saying, well, they were relatively steady where the rest of the, the state was low. Why is that? And it's because they, well, they were able obviously to have data to back that up where the state could say, you know, that's primarily an Amish community. Um, and, and it was interesting, but it's just being in the know and having these, these um, the ability to track data um, as close to live as possible. Um, I, I wanna I wanna use another example. I, I I'm going to use Google instead of Amazon because we did talk about Google a little bit earlier. But um, where you know Google certainly has the resources. They have you know they provide analytics. They provide analytics to our institutions so we can look at different uh, click trends and so forth on different pages um, to promote items, but. Um, so we're going to look at two, two organizations. Somebody, Kate, what's the name of your, you, you work at the- Sorry, I was muted, National MS Society. Okay. So um, how does your, could you make a, a case to say that your budget matches 
the American Heart Association. Um, I, I'm going to say in, in some, I guess it's a, I guess I'm going to say, yeah, I feel like you, like you're going to ask me to do it. I hope not. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> I feel like I would say yes in some ways, because we do a lot of that when it comes to comparisons for the different fundraisers and where we, where we land with all of those, like they literally rank the nonprofits out and like what they're fundraising and stuff. So there's all that criteria that comes into play. So I think because I, I think in a lot of capacity, you, you could, it's not apples to apples, but it's also health, not health organizations. So I, I, I feel, is this the right or wrong answer? No, I'm actually, I'm yeah. asking because you have, you provide a, a service to individuals that are affected by an ailment, as I, does I'm gonna, the, Yeah, I would say yes, then, because I think from the fundraising standpoint, it's very, very similar. I think both organizations have like community outreach and output. I think we provide a little bit more in the sense of um, like direct patient assistance, and I I. I I'm pretty sure American Heart doesn't have some of the same like financial assistance and stuff we do because I actually worked at American Heart too um, okay. years ago. Yeah, I knew um, I knew that. I was just saying that. Did you? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, I was like, whoa! <laughs> there's big data again. Um, no, I so I so I do think I think in a lot of ways you probably could, and they probably have some stuff that we don't necessarily do too. So I I think it's pretty comparable, but I wouldn't say that for like every health nonprofit necessarily, but they're also both national organizations with local presence. Okay, so um, then let me ask you this. Why is it that um, I can probably hear on the radio or see on TV a uh, commercial for the American Heart Association, but I don't see one as frequently for the National MS Foundation? We don't put as much money into our marketing budget. But you're both healthcare providers, not providers, but both supporters. Yeah, but I guess, you know, in, in, in kind of to my argument before, and I'm not like comparing us in that better type thing, but we do put a lot of money into like financial assistance. We put a lot of money, the majority of our money goes into research to, to find a cure and all the different studies and, and, and programs like that. So, you know, is it, is it that we, we follow similar paths, but then there are those areas we, we use it differently. So I think you still could compare in most ways, but then I think I think there's the variations. So we talked about like a couple or last week we were talking about, you know, Augie and Ray's versus Wendy's where they're selling the same product, but they're similar product, but they, yeah. they have two completely different marketing strategies and they collect different, they have different abilities to which collect data. And I think the American Heart Association obviously has the ability to call more data than than the, um, is it the foundation or the association? Um, society. Society, okay. So, um, and, uh, but a mistake that a lot of organizations do is they'll just mirror that of, okay, they'll look at the American Heart Association and say, okay, well, they've got a pretty good marketing model. Yeah. Um, we need to collect the same information when in reality, uh, and I don't have stats in front of me, I don't have my data homework, but uh, I believe many more people are affected with heart ailments than are with MS. Yep. So um, at that point, you actually have a more targeted audience that you can reach out yep. to. Uh, whereas the, with the American Heart Association, we could probably pull everybody in the room right here and say, who has been affected by somebody that had a heart ailment? And you know, my dad, my dad's heart was yep. bad. So, um, so it, it's, it's where when you're building your specific model, you have to look at, it's good to get, you know, to get ideas from other similar industries. Yeah. But you really want to drill down and create your specific model uh, based on your target. And you find your target when you build your strategy. Again, we want to, we want to make more money. Uh, we want to get more return customers. We want to retain our employees and our, our customers. So um, we, we could throw the big blanket like the American Heart Association does and reach out to everybody, or we can kind of use the resources we have internally and target specific pockets of that um, yeah. where we're not going to get the same return, but proportionately for what we're spending, we will. And um, so it, it will help you 
make a more informed decision. And I want to talk a little bit about like allowing us to make decisions based on um, a predictive modeling. I think we talked a little bit about that last week, but so um, we can take on a, using predictive modeling, which is, um, I, I, I want to, I'll give you an example of like John Deere. So John Deere, uh, the tractor company, they put sensors on, the, on, on their tractors and they collect that data from farmers of what time to plant and what time they, what time they pull the crops, what time they, you know, what part of the year that they're, they're harvesting, what part of the year that they're just plowing it over. And they give that data away. Why do they give that away? Because one of the things that we can use data for is one of the top three that our goals for this week is to profit off of that, okay? So why is John Deere giving that data away? Like in hopes that people buy, wouldn't it be in hopes that people buy their product to then use it for that? Purpose? Ultimately, ultimately, right? okay. But there's like an indirect route to that. The, obviously, okay. they're going to make money when people buy a John Deere tractor or a combine or a you know Gator. But so if um and and I think our mindset right now is when we talk about using data as an asset. Well, maybe, what do we first think of with an asset? What do we think of money? Money. So, but could an asset also be leveraging that data to get more data? So, you know, we're giving up that information to get more information. So um, we're now going to have that information out. Um, uh, and these farmers are going to be using these sensors. And so with these sensors, now we're collecting all that information that we gave, we gave away, we gave away the, um, the tool to the farmers. We're collecting all of these different, these times, we're collecting the weather, we're collecting the temperature, we're collecting this, we're getting soil samples, like pH levels, we're, we're getting probably, you know, a terabyte of data back on each particular sensor that goes out there. Now, what are we going to do with that data? Well, then use that to create products that are more effective and filling the needs of what they're finding out based on the data from the sensors, right? That is the, um, that is the very ethical Maria chiming in there. Yes, that is actually, <laughs> actually one thing we're going to do with it. Absolutely. We're going to make a better product, um, a more compatible we're product, it. and we're going to sell it. We're going to leverage yeah. that data and sell it um, to organizations that, you know, want information about the weather, that want information about the soil. So, you know, what comes off as like a good Samaritan move by, by John Deere is actually basically giving them, you know, I, I'm sure you folks have seen the insurance company that says, hey, plug this into your car. And we can, it will give you the safe driver discount. Yeah, you also know everywhere I go, what time I get in my car, what time I leave, you know, um, the addresses I stop at. So you get all the GPS data. Um, and it also scrambles the computer on your car because that happened to me. <laughs> a four-year-old car then had oh yep had the computer completely scrambled, and I had to get a new one, and it wouldn't drive on the Merritt Parkway; it just shut down. Thank you, Progressive Snapshot device. <laughs> Did Flow come out and help you out there? No. Um, Not quick even. aside, though, is it the? Um, Dr. Rick, like one of the best commercials ever with the, uh, you're turning into your parents. I love that guy. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I love that guy. Um, is this a hashtag? Did I hashtag? Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, the, the, these sensors that organizations give out, they're actually using them to leverage the, they're getting far more than the you know, they mass produce these things. Let's say they cost six bucks to make and they give away, you know, a million. So there's $6 million investment. They're going to turn around and broker that data 
for probably, you know, five bucks on the dollar to sell to the social media sites, to sell to other manufacturers. So um, using data as an asset, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're just gonna get it and sell it, um, uh, or we're going to get it and we're gonna leverage it, or we're also going to use it to, to make a better product. So if we're smart, that's what we do with it. But um, if it's a data broker, they're gonna get it in and turn it around, um, just like on the exchange floor. Uh, okay, so making better decisions. Um, give me an example of both an external and an internal, uh, an external internal item that we would want to use data to make a better decision on. So something that externally we'd make better decisions on, internally we'd make a better decision on. Give me an example of a data set we could collect to do that. I'm gonna play the Jeopardy music now in the background. So well, I, I, externally, I would say, like if I'm, if, if I'm looking for externally, um, the so I'm thinking about manufacturing. Externally, there's a big demand for individuals that need to be placed in the industry. I say that's external data. What kind of data, Stephen? What kind of data? Yep. So, um, so okay, if we're thinking about, um, there's a lot of baby boomers that's retiring in the industry right now. So there's a, there's a, there's a big gap and there's a big need for individuals to fill those slots in that industry. So that's external data. So would you look at, and I'll paraphrase for you. So uh, you've got a group of students that are graduating from your class, right? Yeah. Would you then do some research to see what the, what maybe look over across the street and get some demographics on Pratt to see the number of machinists that are of the age of, you know, 60 and up. Um, so you could identify a need and you could use that data, your data of your, your living data of your students so, um, could then fill the void uh, potentially of that gap. So you're using, you're looking at age as a way in which to measure an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Very good. How about an internal one? All right, I'll give you. I'll give you a hint. Let's talk about. Um, let's talk about happy employees. Retention numbers of employees. Turnover. Correct. Turnover. Turnover. So, so what's it's, it's funny because I just was talking about that with somebody. So. A friend of mine, they just they 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 got transferred to a different department, and they're having a conflict with upper management in the department. So I asked the question because you know it's something that they've been complaining about for a while, and I asked how many people have left that company or transferred out of that department. Like let's say in the last 90 days, or let's say since the beginning of the year, and she started naming off uh, different individuals. It was more than five in a matter of five months, not even six months yet, not even six, not even six months in. And I said, that's bad turnover. So that could be internal data. That is internal data. And it's almost, if you're getting that information from HR, um, you could actually consider it as anecdotal data because they're probably not gonna give you a list to say, yeah, these are the clowns that don't work here anymore, but. Um, <laughs> I'd say that, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's right, we have an HR pro in the room, I forgot. I don't um, know if pro would be the word. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, expert, right? Expert. Well, well, I don't know. But, so you said that'd be analytical. <laughs> that'd be uh, anecdotal because we're anecdotal. not going to get we're not going to get names and numbers. Miss Bree wants to violate all types of different like uh, <laughs> FERPA regulations, but um, FERPA. but the so a good example is that like how 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 could so we know we've got turnover, right? What are some ways in which we can measure internal turnover to see that we've got smiley, happy people that work for us? What are well, some so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll throw in just um, the exit interview and exit interview process where you're taking information from people and asking maybe their first and second reasons for leaving or something along those lines. So whether it's pay, whether it's career progression, and then trying to pull that data together, that information to see what are the biggest reasons people are leaving and how can we affect change from, you know, within the organization. That's a great example because you can look at, you can build a predictive model and based on maybe a specific department at the organization that has a high turnover and where everybody could walk in to an exit interview and say, and I like to tell you, Adam Marie, that you look at a couple of choices that they make, you know, a couple of reasons mm -hmm. because they might just be hell bent to just throw somebody under the bus and say, you know, that, that's Stephen Campbell. I couldn't work for that guy for five minutes. He's just so mean um, where uh, they just, you know, they, Stephen likes to work and he's not going to socialize. So maybe he's not as friendly as the other, uh, other folks, but um, in actuality, it's that it is a demanding position and, you know, they, they just really weren't up. I kind of even looked at Amazon where, a lot of people, some great employees get burnt out at Amazon because they can't keep up the pace. So um, it doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just, they're not going to admit that they're bad, but they might say, I'm leaving here because this guy said bad things about my mother. So, you know, you really have to use data to identify a trend and it's not necessarily what the person might say. It's actually the action that the uh, data creates. So we also did um, at our work. So almost like steps before I would reach Maria in like your exit interview, but um, they're doing like pulse surveys and employee engagement surveys um, and same type of thing. So just, I, f I think we, we were doing them pre-COVID just to get like a temperature check on like how everyone was feeling. And it was that whole like, um, oh God, I can't even think now of the, one of those question groups that everybody uses, but it was those like 12 random questions, but then, then they broke it down by, um, by like departments and each department evaluated like where, what their scores were and everything. So that's another way, like before people are looking to leave to kind of get a, a gauge as to like what employee like engagement is or like the happiness level essentially. Was it a myers break? you know? Myers no, um, it's really going to bug me now that I can't think of, um, I'm going to, you keep talking. I'm going to look it up just because it's going to annoy me. Well, I think any company too that does best places to work, if they try to um, put their name yeah. into the hat for that, then it's, then it's similar questions that they ask all of the employees. We use Gallup. Sorry. Gallup. That's what I was. Yep. Yeah. Elise, you have something to say or no? Pratt and Whitney uses like pulse surveys, but it's kind of one of those things where I feel like it's probably anecdotal because they don't actually, they say they want to know specific things, but then they don't really want to know specific things and they can't tell specific people. And so it's, it seems kind of pointless, but then they yep. come to us with the numbers every quarter and they're like, look, everyone's happier. We're doing good. <laughs> so actually uh, we have a student that's that actually just graduated. So and he is, was, a, I think he's still at Pratt, but, um, and he, from a buyer's perspective, um, he's more of like a broker. It would organize purchases, but they use uh, the, the happy customer. You know, uh, our, look, our customers are so happy because 98 out of 100 said they would buy from us again. But if you drill down into those 98 responses, they, you know, 60 of them would buy from them again because they're the only place they could buy it from. So it's kind of like skewed, but the data shows that 98% of our customers would buy from us again. And they phrase it in a way in which you can't really manipulate it. You can interpret it a little bit differently, but um, that's all part of kind of knowing your customer and what putting your data strategy together essentially allows you to get in their head. And if you can get in their head,
And I say that internally and externally. If you can get in their head, you're kind of steering the ship and not from a brainwashing perspective, but you're, you're able to, you won't be blindsided. You're not going to have bad hires. Um, you're actually vetting the process a little bit more if you're using data when you're making decisions, especially when hiring somebody. And there's analytical um, models out there that will build a predictive score on an employee um, as far as it'll look at their past, it'll, it'll just you plug in past employers, references, um, phraseology on the resume aligned with phraseology on the job description they're applying for. And you can get up with a, you can get a predictive match together. And uh, I think I shared last week, uh, I sat on a couple of second interviews for Bridgeport, University of Bridgeport positions. And uh, on, some of, on some of them, the resumes were awesome and they were vetted by our HR department. Uh, and we have a good HR department, uh, but the, they were like, just, just dry as a bone, just zero emotion, just, and we were taking time, we were letting them warm up and so forth, but it just wasn't happening. So but on paper, they were a fantastic match, but um, so, that kind of touches and we're going to get into it later on uh, about inter, uh, artificial intelligence where artificial intelligence can identify something by pulling a data set out and basically calling that and saying this matches this matches this matches you have a perfect perfect match but without the human aspect of that decision you're you're really you know you're limiting that and uh, one of the marketing tests that's done internally for a lot of organizations is called the Enneagram and I think you're going to take the Enneagram in this program. Yeah. Uh, we already oh, took you, it. You already took it? Mm -hmm. uh, wait, so any ones in the room? All right, Cynthia's a one. Who? Any other ones? I was a seven or something. A seven. Oh, you're the PT Barnum, the creative ones. Um, <laughs> at least what were you, a nine? Did you say what were you? A nine? Uh, what's your wing? Do you know? my wing was a one really i don't know i gotta check i gotta look into it i gotta look into it a seven what, a what's one. the what's the one that's like real um structured yes that's a one so i i think my wing was probably a one I, i'm i don't know don't quote me on it though <laughs> it's too late i'm recording this Steve. <laughs> so. but so it, it, here's the, so we, you know, you guys do that as a class, right? So um, we've done it, we've done it with different departments, kind of like to uh, test the waters with it. And um, so here's my, I love it and hate it comments uh, when you pull stuff like that, because um, before you took the test, uh, you kind of knew who you were as a leader. Then you take the test and they tell you, hey, you're this based on these questions that you answered. And let's say, for example, total hypothetical here. Let's say that about six hours ago, you got injected with a Pfizer serum and you're starting to feel like garbage. And you're just like, you know what? Just give me this test. Let me knock this thing off. And you answer it as fast as you can, thinking that you don't really analyze the questions. And then a week later, they tell you, hey, guess what? You're one. I'm like, well, I'm a one because I checked off like the top answer on each one that, that came by. So, and I'm totally cutting it because I do think that there's value to it, but I think that it's got to be, I think that it needs to be spaced out. I think it needs to be done a couple of times because your data sets, even though they might shift a little, are still going to shift based on the particular mood that you're in. And then they, they use that information to align you strategically with somebody else you know seven is real out there thinkers and they round up the wagons but they back off when work needs to get done instinctively because they want to create they don't want the they don't want to be burdened with the task of putting it all together they want to create so then you get your one that comes in there and checks all the boxes and make sure everything's there and that you know you've got x amount of employees that are going to handle x amount of guests and so so then people start looking at it. And I've actually dealt with this in real life where um, somebody totally that works for me that totally screws up. 
the first response was, I'm, I'm seven. It's, it's in my nature, I'm a seven. And uh, I said, no, you're not a seven today. And <laughs> we've really got to, to look at that because it kind of gives us this like faux crutch that we can lean on to say, well, that's who I am, but it's yeah. not. It's really not who we are. So it's, it's a single, it's an identifier, but it's not, it's not like the end all be all, this is who you are, this is what you are. And a lot of organizations use that data to align departments. And I think with Elise, is with the, with the um, pulse checks and even with Kate, um, they use it to kind of take the data to say, yep, we're all happy, everybody's happy. When in reality, it's like, here's a box of donuts. Can you check this off for me? Thanks a lot. You know, where they kind of, uh, I just find them somewhat skewed, but it does take away from kind of a holistic data model where you're collecting it over time and you're making an assessment based on either a trend or a predictive model. So I'm off my soapbox, but so your Enneagrams, I'd like to see if you guys take them again, what they come back as, if they're the same. Um, so anyway, we want to get in their heads. We want to get in our customer's head. And we want to be able to, both our employee and our customer, make sure that we can create some type of model that's, you know, A, either going to keep a customer and have a customer uh, continue to buy from us and keep an employee or conversely identify a, a troubled employee, you know, maybe a rogue employee that, um, who might not be the person that's leaving, but is the person that is kind of, you know, presenting the, the, the scenario to other employees that it, it kind of sucks here. So, and those are the employees that are always filling out the survey as, you know, the sociopath that, no, it's great. I love it. You're awesome. Oh, excellent. And then, you know, as soon as the other, you know, the other, the other people that come to talk to them, they, they kind of spin a different tale. So, but collecting data allows us to identify folks like that because we can then do it through deduction. You know, we can, we can see, like Maria was saying, if you see a trend of, you know, a few people come up in an exit interview and start saying why they're not happy, maybe they don't even have to say they're not happy. We can see that that trend, they're all coming from the same department. They all work on the same shift or they all have the same dean or they all work in the same, you know, um, they all share the same um, dining area. There's ways in which we can de de determine that without having to have a federal inquisition and start, you know, flipping desks in the break room. So, um, so anyway, we look at social media is another piece of ways in which we can track um, good, bad, and different, uh, both internal and external things happening within the organization. So, what's an example of what's an example of a social media post which might identify a red flag to an organization, not to an individual. It was a big uh, one in the news a couple days ago. I think it was in the news again today. Post by an individual that is a red flag to a company? Um, posted, posted a, well, it could be either. I'll leave it up to you. To, to, it could either be a, from an individual or it could be from an organization making a statement. We've got a lot of those lately. Um, I, I got one. We, go ahead, we had a student that made a post on Facebook that, that uh, about the dissatisfaction with the program. That's an excellent, excellent. Um, well, first of all, you're, that student is making a generalization um, based on that particular individual's outcome. So anybody know what that's called? There's a term for it that's been in the news a lot lately. Anybody hear the term virtue signaling? What is it? Virtue signaling. Where virtue? Virtue. virtue. Oh, virtue. Very signaling. Um, so it's where um, you basically pronounce, like for me to virtue signal, I would say that, let's say I got a, say that my Yeti tumbler had a leak in it, right? And they're usually indestructible. So then I would get on social media and say, Yeti is the worst company in the world because I spent $40 for this tumbler and it leaks. 
I could have got one at, you know, could have got one from Sal at Walmart for $14 and it would have done the same thing. So, you know, so I go out and my, I make my post. So virtue signaling is that I make my announcement. This is the side I'm on. So it's happening a lot with the woke and the cancel culture right now. And, and, and that's exactly what that person is trying to do, Stephen, is they're trying to cancel. They're trying to get a shot in at the institution because they didn't have a good outcome. And maybe they didn't have a good outcome because, you know, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't give it their best. But that's, that's not, we're not going to go out there as human beings and say, I was a marginal student and I didn't get my money's worth at Goodman University. They're going to say, I was a great student and Goodman University totally gaffed me. Um, and recently, um, uh, Chrissy Teigen that was the example that oh, I was going yeah. to. Oh, so, yeah. She made some pretty harsh comments to to some folks, and I think uh, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, and Target, I think, like pulled her product. And um, so, who is doing the virtue signaling at that point? This is like almost an ethics class we're having right now, but it's still interesting because it's very topical, and they use data to make their decisions. So I'm the CEO of Target. Um, my virtue signaling is I don't accept what Chrissy Teigen said. I'm not going to sell her cookware here. So um, that that is we're, we're supposed to now say, wow, that Target CEO, that person is awesome. I'm going to go and buy everything I can at Target right now because that CEO did the right thing. It's like no, they're just looking for opportunities to A, get in the news, make a statement, and B, have more customers, you know, they, they're, take, they're, they're hedging their bet where they're going to, excuse my French, piss off 49% of the people instead of 51% of the people. But at the end of the day, it's all about their bottom line. And there was a, uh, a former ESPN announcer that quit ESPN because he just was tired of like when Disney bought it, he totally politicized it. And he's like, that's it. I'm out. We actually, um, we were down in um, Southington when we took uh, Lincoln over a few, few years ago. And I was talking to him at the Chick-fil-A down in Southington with another ESPN anchor. So, but he actually wrote a book that said Republicans buy Jordans too. Because Michael Jordan, in an interview a long time ago, said, "You know, they, somebody asked him, why aren't you, why aren't you political? Why don't you make political statements?'" He goes, "Because Republicans buy sneakers too." So, um, by that, he doesn't want to alienate any of his target market, or not his target market, but his his market, which is, you know, pretty much eighteen to twenty four year olds, uh, or parents of kids going to school. Um, and, and it's, it's great because they, they make these statements in a way in which the virtue signals say, look, I'm on this team or I'm on that, you know, that's my stance. But they do it with a statistical background to say, okay, how will this affect me? You know, how, how, many, how many, what can I potentially lose? So they're almost like staged virtue signaling, which is, you know, kind of spineless, but whatever, you know, we're not millionaires and billionaires that can make that decision. But it's interesting that Getting back to Starbucks, where we look at um, companies that will throw millions of dollars into a venture, they won't do the research on it. And you've got companies that will throw, you know, maybe a million, but several hundred thousand dollars into a marketing campaign based on a single correspondence via Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever the case may be. So, and it, it wasn't all that long ago that Schultz bought. Um, Tavana. So you just wonder how the dynamics have shifted where um, if the optics were more of what they are now, had would that decision still have taken place? Like, would, would, would it have looked as good back then knowing that there were so many more eyes on that decision with social media now than were back then? Would they still have made that decision? Because they would have been crucified for that decision immediately by like the you know, the total teetotalers that were, um, that wanted to keep the culture alive, that wanted to have the atmosphere, 
Um, so anyway, it's just, you know, food for thought to show you how in not a long time um, that, you know, not a long time that has elapsed that so much has really changed in the way in which they analyze data as a means in which to profit, uh, in, you know, uh, not necessarily fiscally profit, but to gain more um, followers, to uh, become more of an influencer, which indirectly leads to a fiscal profit. But um, it is it's very interesting to see. And it's very interesting to think of what Schultz would have done had, you know, Twitter been that active back then. So um, to your, the Chrissy Teigen one, because I love all news, but I was reading about this. Um, the target piece, what did you call it? Virtue what? Virtue signaling. Yes. Um, I read, I think the article is in New York Post, so I'm not claiming it to be like the most valid sources, but they talked about that the the deal actually was decided between Chrissy Teigen and Target to be to end back in December. So supposedly that deal was already done. They were already taking her cookware out of their store, but then this came up and then it came into the news that like, oh my gosh, yep, Target's pulling out too. But like this happened six or seven months ago that that was already like before this whole scandal came out. So it's, but now it's all in the news and everyone's like, oh, Target made this decision. So it's just kind of reiterating what you were saying, but that I just read that the other day. So I thought that was interesting. Well, that's a great point, Kate, because uh, Rebecca, you talked about it earlier about, um, you know, that how it's manipulated. So we kind of like the, the media gets manipulated. So we hear what we want and or, or we hear what they want us to hear. Um, and that the, and you know, a lot of people knock the post, but it's, I think it's, I believe it's the oldest newspaper in the country, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it, my dad always read it growing. So it was always around and now I just read it, but it has a little bit of everything. <laughs> it's second to the current. Harper Current's the longest. Oh, yeah. Really? Come on. Yeah. I'm not a nutmeg. Continuously wrong. So. Okay. I, see, I, I always like the sports page of the post because it mm. was like you flipped it over. It was right there. Um, I like the cake. Is great? It's got a little bit of everything. Yeah. So, uh, but, but I do, I, I think that um, the way the, the, uh, the trending happens right now with the collection of data, it's really Target wasn't gonna come out and say, no, 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 no. We decided that way back when. Right. They were gonna ride that wave and say, hey, look, we're, we're, we're actually trending right now. Uh -huh. So, it, and it's pathetic that our industry, well, I mean, our society is that way. Um, I swear, I, I call it anti-social media because it's just something that there's so many bullies out there that just use it to, you know, to say things that they wouldn't say to you if you were standing in a forum like this, you know, and um, I'd shut my camera off and say, uh, you know, Hannah's a jerk and then turn my camera back on and say, oh, oh I didn't say that. No, somebody, somebody standing behind me said, I don't know who said it, but um, it gives you that cloak of anonymity, which, you know, people take advantage of. But so I, I, I wanna, you know, staying on that track, in, in the Twitter track, one of the things that um, is pretty good from this chapter that really um, kind of changed the industry a little bit was uh, IBM. I don't know if you saw this, but IBM partnered with Twitter. Okay, and um, what they did is they they were able to extract intention and insight out of a tweet. So um, I don't know if that means a lot by saying that, but let me give you an example. Uh, and there's some really crude ones out there where punctuation you know, changes all sense. But if I was to say um, something to the effect of, oh, okay, you, you, know, you guys knew I got my shot today. Um, how are you feeling, Eric? Right, so that could be a tweet. Hey, Eric, how are you feeling, right? Um, now, if they looked at my history and they saw that maybe I posted, uh, you know, got my shot today, or I changed my my um, my avatar to show that I was, you know, inoculated, um, they're going to pull insight from that and say, "Hmm, Eric's not well. Let's start inundating the feed with 
you know, maybe cold medicine, allergy medicines, um, holistic medicines. So they're pulling, basically, they're going to interpret what that tweet means. Now, if I didn't have any previous information, and I don't, and I don't really post social media, but um, if I didn't have any information and, uh, you know, Stephen tweeted me, um, can't wait to see you in class tonight. Um, hope you're hope you're well. The interpretation would not be the same. It would be, uh, you know, maybe the data they would pull from that or extract from that would look to be more along the lines of uh, academic related. Uh, so maybe they'd start pumping in uh, feeds for different, you know, online colleges based on my demographics. But so they can interpret what they can take the, the words out. And, and if um, we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks of how we look at data, how we have internal, external, structured, unstructured. So if I'm looking at a tweet, right, that's unstructured data. So it really doesn't mean a lot, um, but I can pull pieces out of it. I can pull keywords out of it. Like, uh, like you know, if I could tweet out um, Red Sox suck, right? Um, then I, that will, the extraction would be that I don't like the Red Sox and um, I'm a baseball fan. So there could be different things they pull out of it. Now, before, if they just looked at the unstructured data, it would, they would pull keywords out, but they wouldn't pull meaning out. So by the meaning of it is like, I hate their insects. Okay, so if they have insight with that tweet and that data, they know I hate the Red Sox. If they don't, they have suck and they have Red Sox and they can maybe interpret that, but <clears throat> without art, with, with only artificial intelligence, they're not gonna make the connection. So they're taking words, string, <clears throat> excuse me, stringing them together and coming up with means in which to find additional uh, methods of tracking for me. So it's pretty interesting. And IBM spent a ton of money with Twitter to have that done because they're buying the data. And what else did IBM buy? Anybody know? It was a big purchase IBM had. Was it the Weather Channel? The Weather Channel, very good. And have you read ahead in the book? Um, yeah, I do on Sundays, Eric. The whole <laughs> cohort knows. Don't call me at them. So why? I'm not the we... only one. No. But I, I have to be honest, that was, so yes, I, I did read ahead, but you had mentioned it, I think, briefly last week. That was, I mean, until this class, I was like, why, why does anybody want that data? Like, why, like, why is that important, right? Like, I was like, you know, you just go on your phone and you know the data and I know where it is in Chicago or Dublin or whatever. And so reading it this week of like why they did it, I was sort of fascinated, so. Well, and if you tie it in with them, um, if you look at the purchase of, or the, the partnership with Twitter to pull insight, so not, now you have insight, but you're also collecting data from the millions of people hourly that go to the Weather Channel, click on it to try to get the, an indication of what's gonna happen for the next few days, so. It exponentially grows their data collection, which again, one of the three things you want to do with data is use it as an asset. So IBM could care less that you know what the weather is. They're going to then leverage that data and either sell it or trade it. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty interesting as to why they're collecting it, but the you know, because not every, it doesn't seem like a clear match for a lot of organizations, but what they'll do is they'll build, they'll build an algorithm and who knows what an algorithm is. Come on now. Basically uh, a formula, formula, predictive yeah. formula. So pretty close, very close actually. So look at an algorithm as, so if I, Everybody works in Excel, right? And we've all worked in Excel, right? So if we get a whole column full of numbers, um, do we manually add each number up and then enter, enter, and then drop one in cell, you know, 36A at the bottom? This is the total of that number. Is that how we do it? Or what's another way we do it? 
you apply the pattern to the, all the other ones. Yeah, so we go in there, we right click, we format the cell. Uh, we want cell A36 to equal the sum of cell um, A1 to A29. So, so that's a formula. So basically what an algorithm does um, in the layperson term, it's basically a step-by-step -step, um, procedure that's going to be used to come up with a summary or a solution. Um, the Webster's definition, which is a little more clinical is, I got it written down. It's a procedure, procedure for solving a mathematical problem in a finite number of steps that frequently involves repetition of an operation. So algorithm is gonna be running nonstop. It's gonna look for certain data and it's gonna spit it out when it collects it. So um, these companies like IBM are build algorithms. And so they're gonna pull algorithms from people that are um, searching weather in Fresno, California, that are searching weather, like or, or what Hannah said. So searching weather in Dublin from Connecticut so now you're going to see things like, you know, um, visit Ireland, like different tourist things that will pop up on your feed because um, it's spit out of that algorithm that they've created based on their user. So um, an algorithm is really, to, to build your predictive model, you need an algorithm. Um, and they don't have to be as complex as what you know, IBM is doing. You can build algorithms on a much smaller scale but uh, I'll give you an example of what the university has. So we have the predictive analytics model, which looks at, um, it looks at your federal financial aid application, so your FAFSA, it looks at your student application, you know, your entrance application, it looks at um, things like the number of dependents, uh, your work situation, and it pulls like a hundred data points out and it's gonna look at all these, these things which potentially could affect you as a student. So then it, um, the algorithm then creates uh, what they call a retention model, uh, which looks, it, it basically rates you of the likelihood of you being retained as a student, uh, considering all of the ancillary things that are going on in your life, what your, what your ICE or your FAFSA looks like. Um, it can calculate what your aggregate limit is remaining and how at risk you are for that. You know, your aggregate limits are, everybody, you guys remember that from undergrad days, uh, the amount of money which you can borrow. So, um, so this predictive analytics model, which is called the retention model for um, like what we have in our model, gives us that risk factor based on all those elements that we collected we can massage that and change different data points that we want to collect based on, you know, historical perspective. Maybe we want to, you know, maybe a student gets, um, gets a, a point um, or one of the data points that it looks at is if the student graduated high school with a, you know, from a three, five to a four uh, versus a two, eight to a three, four, to a one seven to a two seven, so we can we can scale that and move that around, um, and then adjust uh, based on historical outcomes, and then build a model of the students that are at risk. So what that really does for us as an institution, <clears throat> who can tell? Actually, before I like, you know, spoil the crescendo here, what what, what does that help us do as an institution? What, what what are we getting to by using a predictive model? And just switch your hat, your hat for one second and picture this, picture us as an emergency room. Why would it be important? Getting people in and out quickly. Which people, Hannah? Oh, the patients. Right, but what, but what type of patient? So if I'm, if I'm able to- the, and then the, the ones who have the most, I don't want to say the most need. Okay, so you're, you're absolutely right. It is I, the most I, need. I felt like need was bad in an emergency room, though. I was like, those most hurt. 
I don't well, know. If you, to if you think about it, right? If you look at, I know we've probably all sat in the emergency room, right? And mm -hmm. if you see somebody walk in holding their chest or getting wheeled in, they're the first ones in. Mm -hmm. You know, us with a broken finger, you know, like cut, we're going to sit and wait for a little while. But so what, what a predictive model does for us is it allows us to identify um, a term that a Harvard professor coined is the students that are closest to the door. So we can identify the most at risk based on a predictive model of a series of what might seem to be completely unrelated, um, you know, pieces of historical data in their life. Like you know, that they care for an adult parent at home. So that's a risk factor because that cuts into the amount of time that they can study um, or they work more than 37 hours a week. Well, that's a risk factor that cuts into the amount of time. So, and it's way more in depth. There's, like I said, about 110 data points that we'll pull to build this model. And, and then we will then reach out and triage the students that are most at risk. So, um, I think it's uh, two sides of the coin from an academic piece. And Rebecca, you might be able to chime in on this as well from, from the academic side of the house, but you'll run into some professors that say, I don't wanna know this student's at risk. I wanna treat this student like, you know, Joe or Jane, Joe or Jane Doe, John or Jane Doe. And, um, and you know, we, You've got a lot of faculty that will say, look, we have the creative freedom. We can kind of do what we want with this class and so forth. And we're, we're, we're not unionized, so we're pretty liberal. And we get kind of, kind of let them go with the flow. But um, is that something you think would fly at your school? Rebecca, you have a, you have a small school, right? Um, in terms of like sharing the data that might we might not yeah. want to share? Yeah, do you think you get some pushback from faculty if they if they kind of had a flag on students that were at risk coming in? Like, um, it's interesting because yeah, we have um, we have a network of people who who are on the need to know basis, and then there's the people who are not. So somebody would be notified, um, but the faculty may or may not be, or if they were, it would be by like you know whether it's like a disabilities coordinator or a counselor or something like that. So it kind of depends. Um, so yeah, some people will get access to that information, but even some people who believe that they have the need to know are not allowed to have that. Cause yeah, we don't want them to, unless the student discloses it to them personally. Okay, so now we're, it's just a, it's a holistic snapshot where the student, the, so it's not like um, where we're identifying a student that might have a disability that, you know, it's, um, what it is is so it's just a number so and with the with the holistic advising model that the college is incorporated so every student in the university has an academic advisor a career services advisor a financial literacy coach um, and the the part of that holistic model each semester changes when that faculty member changes out so if you take english 101 and you have dr fox and then you take an English 102 in the fall and you have Dr. Um, Kanye. Um, Dr. Kanye then jumps into that holistic model. So they're made aware of a number, but they're not necessarily privy to the notes and the comments and the, um, unless they have like an administrative role at the universities. I mean, it's, we vetted this thing through FERPA like a million times, so. Yeah, that's, but, that's interesting. But it's the ethical piece that you get some of these, you know, these professors like, you know, the high and mighties like Stephen that are going to say, I don't need to know that my student uh, has a 2.7 GPA because um, they want to treat that student like, you know, they have a four coming in there. So, um, but anyway, you, that's a case of creating a predictive model to help both the student and the institution. But at what point are you crossing the line ethically when you're, you know, as an organization, if you were a hospital and you were buying wearable data. So I, I, I went out and purchased, I work at Yale New Haven Hospital and I purchased all of the wearable data from Apple in the 203 area code. Yeah, that's the that's Southern Connecticut area code. So, and then everybody, I look at everybody that had a resting heart rate of 78 and higher 
and I target outreach that group to say, you know, um, get your checkups. Um, I start selling um, cholesterol medication. I start prescribing them different pharmaceutical um, uh, emails and messaging. So is that ethically right to do? Do we have to tell the customer we're doing that? We do not have to tell the customer we're doing that. And when we signed off on our, our iOS 14.4 release that came to our phones or our iPads or our watches, um, we gave them permission to use that data however they see fit. So, and if the hospitals think that they can profit off of that, they're gonna purchase it. So, and it's gonna be under the guise of, we're really looking to help you out. We really wanna make sure that you're healthier. Um, and then next thing you know, you've got like, uh, you've got, you know, you're inundated with these, these commercials about, you know, like all the side effects from COPD or from the, you know, psoriatic arthritis, whatever they, I see these commercials every day. But, um, so anyway, um, there's an ethical piece that we don't have to tell the customer that we're collecting the data because well, customers- I got a question. Just, just because, just because it's legal doesn't make it ethical though, or does it? No, no, absolutely right. It doesn't. And, and we're going to kind of segue into that because well, anybody been involved in the data breach? Statistically, mostly everybody in this class should have been involved in a data breach. In 2017. Like when, with Target? <laughs> Target. Huge Target. 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 Anthem. Anthem is one. Yep. I think Anthem. Had <laughs> um, Equifax. Um, yes. And the biggie was Yahoo. Yahoo was huge. So uh, I think Yahoo disclosed, I think Yahoo disclosed that it had given access inadvertently to 1 billion accounts, okay? 1 billion accounts, it's not like Dr. Evil, 1 billion accounts. <laughs> um, when, no, 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 my bad, my bad. It was 500 million accounts, they said, back in 2014, 500 million accounts we were, were compromised. Then it was, they came out the next year and said it was, you know, it wasn't 500, it was actually a billion that were compromised, it was twice that. So they did an investigation, it turned out to be 3 billion. It turned out to be every account that they had was compromised. That's what I was gonna say, I, I did watch that video of the top five and I remember one of them said every single, like can you, every account. Like, at least when you get like the target one in your mind, you're like, oh, it's not me. Like, I stand a chance. But like in that particular case, it was literally everyone. That's yes. just so messed up. And the, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, they believe it was internally done, um, the, the hack. But wow. the, the, the problem is that, um, most of the people that did, that went in and reset their password reset it to the same thing. So because they wanted that familiarity and Yahoo didn't have like a mechanism in place which could say, no, you got to change your password this time. And I don't know if you've ever plugged the password in and you get the little meter underneath it where it's like, no, too weak. You got to make it stronger. So Yahoo never really monitored that. So then they came out back in like 2016 and said, hey, you need to strengthen your password. Um, so part of that, you know, the collection of data and getting all those data points um, makes, again, we don't have to tell our customer we're doing it. Externally, you know, um, the employee, I mean, the, uh, the customer signs an agreement, you know, when they click on the accept or when they sign their application, they give us the right to that information. Uh, but internally, Again, we don't have to tell the employee, but if we're trying to track internal data, um, pro or con, excuse me, should we tell an employee we're collecting data? I mean, it's not if you don't want them to skew it. But don't, don't, 
it, it, it used to read the agreement terms. It it doesn't mention that in the agreement. We're talking internal now, Steve. We're talking internal. employees. So, uh -oh. Marie, what I were you saying? I was. I would say, from my own perspective, any time that you give knowledge to people that they maybe didn't have otherwise, they may turn it into a bigger deal than they typically would, just because they're they're more aware of it. Which doesn't make it good or bad necessarily, but I think a lot more people would raise a red flag when typically it wouldn't really affect them at all. So, yeah, and I guess on, on the pro side of telling them. Um, it's much better for you to tell them if right. you're the person collecting data is then, you know, um, then Johnny Rocket at the, from like a lawsuit or something. Yeah. Or like a class action suit or find out yeah. from somebody over at the proverbial water cooler saying, you know what? They, I, I was told that I punched in late three times in the last 36 days. Um, and that, you know, like I, um, I my, my pattern show whatever like that. So, you know, then kind of the, uh, the trust factor drops and you get the engagement, um, the, the engaged employee tends to disengage. And that's when you start, you know, you're, you start seeing the, uh, the turnover happen. But so again, ethically, you, you don't have to tell them, um, uh, or I, sh I should say legally, you don't have to tell them ethically, it's always in the best interest to disclose that. I think transparency in that particular instance for an employee is super important. Um, I think for a consumer, you'll see in your case study this week or in your discussion board this week that um, you can kind of use the Spotify method in which they collect the data and you can see, you know, you can kind of scratch your head and say, well, they probably didn't handle that the best way, but um, Usually, if you're transparent about something like that, it's um, it's not going to come back and bite you because you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, but uh, when we talk about data breaches and letting our customers know, um, it's our responsibility. They're giving us the data, and somebody mentioned earlier today that they're, you know, I think it might have been you, Kate, where you're talking about. Um, you know, we're kind of giving you, we're, we're, we're giving the, we're giving you the data, we're giving you our information, but our responsibility is to protect that information. So we have to come up with these serious encryption, um, this encryption software that's going to prevent hackers from, you know, layers and layers of encryption. And you probably all saw one of the first announcements on our Canvas page was we have dual authentication now. So you log into a Windows product and it's going to send you a text and the text is going to tell you to plug in these six digits. So that's like a multi-layered authentication process. And a lot of vendors use that now because of the hackers and because they are securing so much information um, of, of other people's. So um, both from an employee standpoint, uh, schools are huge targets because they both have employees, they have financial records, and they have um, they have uh, student information. And traditionally, like um, an undergrad student email account is one of the easiest email accounts to hack because they you know they usually will have a very uh, simple password. They'll have something that's uh, repetitive, they'll have, you know, and, and it's not like that somebody sits at a keyboard and plugs in and starts checking passwords. It's just they build these sequenced programs that will rattle off passwords and they just unlock frequently. So anyway, um, part of collecting data, the responsibility is to make sure that you're protecting that data because we don't have the dough that Yahoo has to say, my bad. Three million, three billion accounts for hacked. Um, yeah, we won't do it anymore. Um, the the problem that the industry has is because there's so much e-commerce right now, the FCC does not have strict enough laws to enforce that. And if you've noticed some of the bigger cases, it's essentially wire fraud that they're being transferred uh, or being charged with, or interstate commerce fraud. Um, if it's like you know within, if it's if it's uh, anything that's done through the postal service, they can get, they can tag in um, mail fraud. 
but but straight data hacking is so hard to punish because of the um, the lax codes. We're not up to speed from a government perspective. We're not up to, up to speed to maintaining the policing that needs to happen on the web. So, um, so any future hackers out there, there's you know quite an opportunity for you. So if you want to take your take your skills that way. Um, okay, so I'm trying to, uh, I, I, I want to just kind of spin this into still with social media, but I want to maybe even go back to Maria, if you don't mind, if you're not in too much pain, but if you ever found yourself uh, in an HR role, um, stalking a candidate, like looking at their social media profile? It's a good question, and I know how I'm supposed to answer it because I think when people are putting information out on social media it is there. I never, I didn't do it as much in part because when I was recruiting, I just didn't have the time. Um, but in part also because I really wanted to have them prove themselves a little bit more during the interview process. But I certainly have done it every so often, at least just kind of a quick, quick type of thing. I think I would do it more if I saw red flags in maybe an initial interview and I was like, mm, what's going on with this? So, but I know a lot of people absolutely do it when they're recruiting. So, and, and I know so many Rebecca. students who get so mad where they're like that, like that's personal. It's like, it, you put it on the world wide web. Yeah. So, I mean, like it, they get really bent out of shape about it. And it's like, I guess I understand that like your generation was born to doing this, but it is a choice and you don't have to do it. And so if it's out there, like it's there to be possibly used against you. But from the HR, so I've, I've done a lot of hiring at my job and like from the, and worked closely with the HR team. And I, I don't look at it because I also don't want like my personal bias to come into play with like what, like, yes, you're talking about like red flags or depending on what they post, but there's so much stuff that can't come into play on whether or not you hire someone. And there's already so many biases, whether it be everything from like education and age and back, like there's so many things just on a resume that you can make judgments on that I don't necessarily want to dive deeper into their social media because that doesn't necessarily explain them. But doesn't that fall into where, you know, we talk about the whole social media thing and checking when you're hired by someone and there's always that little print in there that you are a representation of the company. And so that includes how you behave on grounds as well as off grounds. So if you're on social media um, and I think, you know, you you're posting weed and you rolling up weed and whatever else and you're working for a drug a drug addiction agency or whatever you know uh substance abuse agency it's not a good look yeah. so you know and that's why like you know and I tell people like you, you gotta be careful what you put yeah on social media and what you make public because you know your employers or your prospective employers can and will check it and I've known where people have done that like, um, I know a woman who had applied for a job and she didn't get the job because she posted one day where she called out sick and was at the beach. <laughs> and posted beach, exactly. I mean, you can and, certainly get terminated based on particular things that you put on social media. Cause like yeah. you said, you're supposed to be a reflection of the, of the company and the organization. And if people are seeing that and associating your organization with the actions of this person, that's not good. A lot of people talk about that first amendment, right? I've actually just recently did a training on this, um, but that only covers you in, in, in situations with the government, the free speech. That doesn't mean you can just say whatever you want and not have any consequences from a, you know, from a work perspective. So it's very, very complicated. I actually used to work at um, Gateway Community College and I worked running the labs and one of the professors, there was like the coveted summer semester because they were condensed. They were like, you know, for a lab teacher, it was like really nice to be able to have the students there the whole time. And she had worked there so long as an adjunct professor and like waited, finally got the position and then had just a rough semester over the summer and had a student who gave her a run for her money and she had posted something on her social media account where she thought was, you know, private or whatever, but the student had a mutual friend with her. So she was able to see that she had posted something negative. And then they had, sorry, they had then in turn 
went and went to the dean, went to like the head of like the science department and like put it on blast and everything. And she was no longer allowed to teach the summer sessions anymore because of that, all of that. Yeah, the sad thing is nothing is really private. <laughs> you, you try to make it and maybe it is to some people, but to other people it might not be so. Well, I know, do, do we say who, or do we, did all of you watch The Social Dilemma yet on Netflix? Yeah, um, I did. So the, the person that created the like button uh, was one of the I guess, interviewees there. But um, so organizations will buy, they'll, they'll, they'll purchase the, um, basically the likes so it doesn't mean that you even say something bad about an employee, an HR firm, maybe like you have a, um, a third party HR firm if you're small and you don't have the ability to do the uh, resource and the, or don't have the resource to do background checks and so forth. So they will buy the likes and they will identify the, what this person basically, you know, associates with, you know, if they like some pretty crude posts, they, they might dissuade that company to hire this individual, but the like button is so powerful because it's a single click that will identify, you know, it, it, it's identifiable in a number of different ways for both pro and con, but um, from a marketing perspective, uh, there's, it, it's very uh, essential to Facebook's bottom line, you know, because the more likes they get, the more people that are engaged, the longer they're on the page. And anybody know what the like button does for us? gives us a rush you know it gives us a rush of dopamine dopamine makes us what's the difference worse. between dopamine and serotonin Elise? i think i think serotonin yeah that's right let's go to the science science uh i don't know if that's your kind of science but it might be <laughs> well i think the serotonin is more like you're relaxed and you're calm kind of like that where then the dopamine is more like a rush and you get like a little gratification I think one is more tied with the adrenal gland where it's, where the other one is more, um, again, like a mellowing where it's like a, like a kind of like a, um, like a, a reward, but not like, you know, you're not really leveraging it, but yeah, like calm or euphoric or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I only, I was a business undergrad, so I only, I only had to take bio 120, so I'm good. Um, <laughs> I'm tapped out at that. Uh, but so even from a, an internal perspective, the a like button on Facebook could dissuade an employer from hiring someone from a position. And even though ethically most of us have agreed that, yeah, I'm not gonna, you know what, let let the let the candidate um, have the opportunity to present without us kind of playing Sherlock Holmes. But um, if you don't have a large margin of error and you've got to make a really good hire and you don't have the resources to spend, you know, eight to $10,000 to train a new employee, you might order and dance around the ethical line to, to pull some of that data up to make that decision. So that's all part of being a leader and making data-driven decisions. So can I ask this, because so much of this, um, and it might just be the topics we've talked about tonight, but so much is like related to like negative connotations, like it, does a company look and see like the positive things they liked and think like, wow, what a great employee. Like, I want to hire them. Like everything we're saying is to look at like the negative piece. Like, is there that like happy side at all? Or is it really like to, to highlight the things that aren't what they want? So I, I really like in the research that I've done, most of the, most of it turns to a like, as you said, a negative, most of it spins at a negative connotation because um, if the candidate's gotten that far, it's almost, um, if you heard the expression, sometimes if it's too good to be true, it probably is. You know, like, you want to make sure that you're validating okay. that. Um, so I don't think it's intentionally to look for the negative. I think it's more of red flags. You know, yeah, you know, something yeah. that might stick out that you could offer, the employee could have, or potential employee could then maybe offer an explanation, not that, you know, how do you dance around that in an interview or say, hey, we noticed on your Facebook page that you called in sick that day, but you were actually at the beach. But um, so it, it is, again- Tell me more about that. <laughs> I, I don't think, uh, again, I don't think it's, 
meant to, to accentuate the negative. It's the negative that comes out when you're searching for that. Uh, and I, I don't know, like for example, like I know Elise, you're a huge animal lover, right? Um, and how's Baba doing by the way? Good? He's doing good. One step down, you got a little bumper thing on there now, it's all funky. Wow, that's awesome. But now let's say somebody um, that was that didn't like animals, that um, was interviewing Elise and just did, did some background, right? I'm pretty sure all of us would say, oh, that's awesome that you take care of like a lot of animals and you're so caring and it's, you know, I mean, I think anybody, I, I don't want to sound like an idiot, but I could probably hurt a human before I could hurt an animal because an animal really typically can't defend themselves. But, um, um, but anyway, there's people that will look at that and say, no, oh, Look at all these, look at all the iHeart dogs and, you know, MSPCA and look at all these affiliations that are tied with Lisa's social media account. Um, it's just kind of like an animal nut, forget it. You know, it's not a good fit for us. So what we look at as a positive, somebody might look at as a negative because when they were seven, they got bit by their grandmother's dog, you know, so crazy like that. So we, we turn it into a negative con connotation because we, you know, it's just creating a trend in wh whether that trend fits for that particular situation, you know, it, it's huh. anybody's guess, but um, somebody could find something on every single one of our, they could find a pattern on every single one of our social media pages and come up with a way in which we're, you know, we're some evil maniacal scientists, some are looking to, you know, blow up the world, but it's just their interpretation. So can't change that. I know I'm not going to like stuff on Facebook anymore or do anything because now <laughs> it tells. Well, for example, like in one of the reasons it was talking about it can tell your relationship status just by the things that you like. And I'm like, oh, now I I'm going to be some like, of that is bull crap. I, mean, Honestly, gonna... I think some of it is taking it way too far or like if somebody wanted to do that, they could. But I, I don't know. I think that's the part where then, yeah, you just got to be like, whatever. I don't know. I'm scrutinizing everything. I don't trust it. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me give you the target story, which I don't remember if I read it in this book, but so I don't know it, um, about the young lady at target, you know, shopping at target, she lived with her parents and um, she gets a prenatal package sent to the house. Um, and target took the initiative based on, all of her purchases or her, not her purchases, what she was looking at and on her, on their page, what she was um, looking at on the web about, you know, um, any uh, prenatal things. So they took the initiative to say, based on what this person's purchased, um, then uh, this person must be pregnant. So they shipped a prenatal package to the house which she lived with her parents. So the mother gets the package and she's like, do we need to talk? And uh, they ended up suing Target because the mother didn't know that the daughter was pregnant and it caused you know, a big riff with the family was a violation of privacy. And what Target interpreted as a really good thing to be proactive and to have a customer that's gonna come and buy the diaper genie and the, you know, the changing stations and all their diapers and the onesies now just totally ripped a customer that will never shop there but they were just trying to be the first to get their business. So there's, there's, there's the creepy side of it, but you know they do create a profile based on your history and they can tell you, Google right now can tell any one of us if we're married, single, um, how much money we make, where we shop, what kind of cars we drive. So it's just based on all of the information we've shared, whether it's when we bought a car and had a car loan application, we had service on a vehicle and they plugged our information in the system um, where we go to eat regularly on a Saturday night. So they can build a pretty good profile on us based on the data trail that we leave. So don't sell them short, Rebecca. Well, have you told them that you're single or in a relationship or all that kind of stuff, but I don't know if they can like, you know, predict. Well, no, I think it's more yeah. like they see, okay, Rebecca's posting the same picture with the same guy at a beach like she hasn't put she's you guys can predict whether i'm married or single 
<laughs> right, right. So I think it's more that, but I totally get what you're but saying. But the computers actually. don't really care. Yep. <laughs> no, but uh, what happens when we didn't even talk about tagging? You know, when you're tagged in a photo or a location is tagged in a photo, they can tell that they can tell how many times I've been to Newport in the last three years based on how many photos are tagged over there in time. The scale. information with digital photos, that's the one thing that does scare me is that like there's so much, I don't even know what you call it, but it's like. In yeah, it's all the metadata that's in there. Talking. Um, but uh, is I cannot get Facebook to stop tagging my face as my mother it's the craziest thing and it's and because they think they know better like it's really hard to undo and i have tried several times and i can't have you thought of like reconstructive surgery to alleviate that problem? i have <laughs> i have and i don't know i mean, I mean the, there is a resemblance there but it's just funny because there'd be like my mom literally never goes anywhere like she owns a bed and breakfast and she stays home and so like she'll get all these notifications that's like you were tagged at you know in portland oregon and, you know or like that she was at some event and it's just like really funny to her because she honestly doesn't go anywhere but facebook makes it look like she's going all these places but it's actually me and see that's like so that's basically what they're doing is they're taking um, unstructured data and creating a model based on the closeness of, you know, you are essentially, because she doesn't post or doesn't go out, you're kind of, she's vicariously part of your posts. And that's what they're, they're creating that model based and on. It, and you can't break it. Even if it's incorrect, it's so it defaults to that, right? out there. Yeah, it's hard to fix. So it is. It is a, in a simpler time, you could have called customer service and said, hey, stop mixing the pictures up. But now. Um, I don't think there's a customer service number for Facebook. I, <laughs> I know have, my mom's tried with Airbnb and it's been a real run around. But yeah, for Facebook, forget it. I have Zuckerberg's personal phone number. So we can call <laughs> him up later and, um, and change that. But, you, you know, seriously, Rebecca, they don't want to. They, they'll inconvenience you because it's allowing them to collect more data. So, because you're making that correction each time. So um, it's actually where it would be, so it's defaulting to a standard tag and you're overriding that tag each time. So essentially what's happening is for every time that picture or picture is posted, there's two clicks, where for the rest of us, it would be one click. So um, they don't want to correct that error because you're increasing the amount of time you're on a page, which is help, which helps them sell that particular maybe series of likes or particular product. Um, if you tag it in a photo, if you tag it, if you tag it in your byline, like you know at the beach using the Hawaiian traffic SPF 30. So it's just the amount of time you're staying on the page. So they're never gonna fix that. So sorry for your inconvenience. <laughs> I, I feel for you. Um, so I don't really have much more. Um, anybody have any questions about what we covered tonight or I'm gonna go over like what we have coming up this week for a discussion in our writing module, but anything before we shift over there? Do we learn anything tonight? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Stephen. Rebecca just gave me kind of like a like a like a squinty half head nod. I mean, come on. I might just be lost on some of it, but hopefully it'll be grounded in the reading. I'm like, I don't know if I need more like diagrams or what, but I, yeah, for data, it's it's hard for me to. There's a there's it. a. There's a like a 40 minute Amazon video I linked in here, um, which has a good predictive kind of modeling. Okay. That, that's helpful. Um, another thing um, from a browser perspective, I would jump over to, uh, I use this browser call, I think it's DuckDuckGo, right? And it doesn't track. So it will give you like an unabridged, like where Google might be somewhat like, you know, they might, shield you from certain things based on you know your browser history 
um, DuckDuckGo is kind of like a kind of a clean one, and it'll give you some other information. But um, create uh, in a DuckDuckGo uh, search, do predictive analytics, and there's a couple of good videos that pop right up on predictive analytics. That there's a TED talk, uh, and I think I've got it in week five. I put it in there about essentially it's looking at uh, our data that we have as the exhaust of a car. So um, after, you know, after you put gas in the car and you turn, you use it for uh, engine combustion to make your, the engine move, you know, the cylinders pop and then the, the rods move, um, the exhaust comes out and basically dissipates in society, right? So our data is the exhaust and it just, we, we got what we needed out of it. It got us into that app. It got us uh, access to this particular product, but now it just dissipates because we don't need it for that particular tool. So what's happening, if you look at it from a, I guess like this real strange metaphor, but so imagine now Google coming up with this big like type of vacuum that's sucking up all this exhaust and then culling through and synthesizing that exhaust and pulling from what they need. So there's value in the exhaust that we don't see, but everybody else sees it that collects data. So that's why, you know, don't beat yourself up for, I'm not really grasping it because it's such a large thing. Big data, you know, is the, the amount of data that's out there as we talked about last week is, you know, if we had to sit here and count every piece of it, there's not enough time in, in, you know, in the universe for us to do that. But, um, but we don't care because we need, we use what we need. And that's the whole point of this particular class is to see where it fits for you. And we're, you know, obviously we both work in higher ed. So, you know, you, you can certainly pull from it similar things that, you know, like from a higher ed perspective, what you can and can't do, what softwares you use, what they're pulling and so forth. But it might be something weeks. that's easier to chat with you about too. And to like, kind of like share the aspects that I'm working in and like, figure out, should I actually try to apply it to exactly what I'm doing? Or should I look at it from a different lens that's either bigger or smaller? The fact that I've changed jobs in the last nine months, I think has also scrambled my brain and ability to really like see the big picture. So that's where it's like, I want to take what we're learning and apply to what I'm doing now. However, I'm still learning so much of that. So yeah, yeah. maybe a one-on-one -on -one conversation would be helpful too. Definitely. Definitely. So yeah, it's really, it's just really trying to see the forest through the trees and understand what the significance of, of this information is and how some people use it, some people don't, but um, it's designed to give us the ammunition to make better decisions. And that, that's at the end of the day, that's kind of the cherry on the Sunday of what we need it for. And if you have too much information, your decisions get watered down and they're not as effective. If you don't have enough information, your decisions are less effective. Um, it doesn't mean they're right or wrong. They're just, you know, you're you're not using all of your resources because we're resources going into it. So, um, so Stephen, I cut you off. Do you have something to add? Well, I was just going to ask you how how many times have you taught this course? Uh, this is my sixth time. People usually don't leave here looking at things the same way, huh? No, I, I, and you know, and I, and I think it's because it's not because I do a good job. It's because they're so fearful of it coming into it that they see how like right in front of them, it really is. And then um, kind of get a basic understanding around, you know, their model, what fits, what fits them. So, but I do think it is an eye opener and I've told you, and I don't know if anybody in this cohort did it, but um, every semester that I've taught this, somebody's gone to Sandy before this class to register, before they could register for the class and ask if there was an elective that they could take instead of data. And she's like, no, unfortunately, it's kind of the first class you take after your first semester. So, because you need the prereq of 500 and 510. But um, it is, it's an eye opener, you know, because we deal with it every day. We just really don't realize it. So, yeah, I think like Rebecca said, I mean, I see, well, I think at least for me, I see a lot of value in it, but I just don't even have any idea how to just wrap my head around 
all of it, how I can use it, what I could use it for, what it means, how to think about it. Like, it's just still so new to me. So, yeah. I do I think it is. It. What, I Steven? Do. I said, I have a lot of ideas on how I can use it. Oh, there you go. Well, you can share some it's with me then. <laughs> Wait, this, but, but, this, but this is why I stay away from like a lot of online things. Like I've I've had these ideas about it, but just just hearing the conversation at night, it's like okay, it makes sense. It just I just never imagined it. Like I, I never imagined it going to the depths that you like. What y'all talked about with the lady getting fired from going taking a day off because she's sick and going to the beach, like. <laughs> That's funny. That's a good one. But I would never do that. Feel better. Like that. I wouldn't fire someone for that. Uh, uh, no, but I, I'm not that concerned about that. <laughs> but just to, but just to, just to have that insight that these things do happen, and and that's how they like. That's something that that's 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 data that's, that can be tracked. Like just those little things. It's like it's interesting to me. I just was going to say, honestly, to build off what you just said, Stephen, I think, and like Eric, you don't necessarily give yourself enough credit because the stories and the examples you're giving are so relatable that even though we're like kind of struggling wrapping our brain around it, being able to tie it to Chrissy Teigen or Target or our own jobs, like I think it gives it um, like a an ability to understand it a little bit more than we would have if it was just this like high level conversation. So I do appreciate that piece of it because at least if I don't first get what you say, then you give it to a real life example. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's what you're, that's where you were going with that. So that's been helpful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I didn't think I'd ever be able to use Chrissy Teigen as like a teaching tool <laughs> in school, but. Now you can say you did. My dad says you can always use her as a bad example. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so let's I'll talk about before we wrap. And I, I will tell you, so I totally felt like garbage at like 540. I tried to scoff down something and I've got my Gatorade in a little cooler here. But um, just like hanging with you guys. I, I have like, I found like my second win. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And you give me the leeway to, to do it from home tonight. So um, thank you. Uh, so this week's discussion, uh, Spotify in chapter two um, kind of manipulated what they call their free app where they essentially took your grandmother's eye teeth as collateral for you to, to listen to some of their music. So um, the question that we ask is, what is the proper amount of data harvested with a free app? What does that look like for us individually? So, um, you know, we know we're giving up something when we sign the, you know, the accept and we always see the in-app purchase little, tiny little font up there above the app purchase. So. Um, so just, you know, what do you think is the right amount of data to give up for a free app and using the Spotify example, you know, did they take advantage of their customers? Spoiler alert, they did. So, um, and again, uh, I'm not hung up on APA. It could be 250 words, a nice, heavy, robust conversation, uh, you can go out as far as you want on the limb as as a um, you know dealing with uh, any type of hypothetical situation to tie in. Um, just make your point. Answer two of your classmates with 200, 200 word responses. Um, that's the minimum. So, and then uh, you want to make sure that you you're try to get like a. Um, Try to get a video post in at some point. It doesn't have to be this week, but try to work on that because another point of this class is to prepare you and how to not only identify data, but to deliver it. So in, in the virtual age that we are right now, bless you, the digital um, replies are probably more frequently viewed than the written reply. So, and not in our discussions, but we're going back to social media where are you gonna watch a video uh, or you're going to read a two paragraph 
you know, when, when somebody's like, you know, starts the paragraph underneath the picture with, let's see who of my friends read this, boom, you're on to the next one right after that sentence, you know, or um, like uh, cut and paste this to your wall. Nope, I'm out. Just go to the next one. But if there's a video there of like, you know, like uh, a dog knocking somebody over, I'll watch that all day long, you know? So anyway, if, if you can work a video in every now and then just to try to get practice doing that. Uh, our writing module is, um, again, we're, we're going back in time. We're gonna sit in the uh, boardroom at Starbucks when they start to see like some of the, you know, some of the luster come off the, the, um, the prize that is Tivana. Um, and we're gonna uh, make recommendations on a data strategy for Howard and company. So we're gonna uh, basically tell them what they missed, uh, what they should look at. And again, this ties into our final. So uh, two to three pages. Uh, and just remember, it's past the halfway part of the second page. It makes the two page standard. Um, your reference pages do not count as a page. So introduction, uh, thesis statement, conclusion, APA format, double space. Okay, we'll do double space um, and 12 point font. So just uh, at least two citations, two references. So um, that's it for, for the week. That's again, papers are due Tuesday night, 11.59, along with your peer responses and your initial post for your discussion board is Saturday night, 11.59. Because uh, I wake up Sunday morning, just can't wait to read those things. I just jump right on them. And, uh, you look like it too. <laughs> <laughs> is that a compliment or an insult, Stephen? <laughs> uh, I had a question on um, one of the things that was, I guess it was in last week's module, but like the case study instructions I couldn't get those to download for me. Like when I go to open them, it says um, like failed to load PDF document. I don't know if anybody else got that. Like I can get the. Are you talking about like the details of the case study? Because I think Eric had emailed us. So that might be an easier way to get it. Okay. So I think we had trouble. A couple of us had trouble opening that in class last week. Okay. So um, I think I emailed it either after class or um, because the link didn't come over from black, the link was a blackboard link that didn't, okay. didn't convert to canvas it, yet. Yeah. Rebecca, I can forward it to you. That, that would be great. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Cause I just feel like there's like three PDFs there and I think only one of them came through for me. And I think I got one out of the email, but you know, there's like what the case study instructions, the case study, like analysis, like guidelines, and then the Tivana case PDF. Yeah, and I will just give you um, uh, the case study guidelines um, that uh, is barely worth the paper it is written on. Okay. So, um, I wouldn't put a ton of credence into that because okay. I would much prefer that you express yourselves um, more, I guess, emotionally than analytically. So just keep that in mind, but, you know, uh, read through it and, but don't put a lot of stock in it. It's it's a stand, it's Sandy standard for a case study. More more of the case studies are going to happen later on. Like I know we do in a strategic planning, we do a case study, but these are still more um, uh, essay responses at this point. Okay. So the case study is really going to be the uh, presentation at the end of the at the end of the mod. That's going to be your okay. your virtual physical speak to case study. It's not going to be. Uh, a written case study. And we just like, do we keep reading more about um, Starbucks and Tivana? Cause that stuff isn't in the book, right? Like we got that case study from market line and yeah. that's what we're going based off of in addition to anything else that we look up about it. Yeah, you're gonna pull some ancillary okay. research from that but that's kind of your Bible for this particular mod. Okay. Um, and so that one's very like, here's all what, here's everything they did wrong. And so, you know, as yeah. I was like, well, okay, you know, I definitely researched my own of, well, why did we do it? 
why did it sound like a good idea? Um, so, and then as you had talked about, like, well, they ignored all this data. So then I started trying to look for more things because, um, and maybe I just need to go back and read the case study again, but um, I hadn't seen as much concentrated on the data that they ignored yet in the things that I had read. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. Well, you know, and, and I, I don't want to sound like, you know, the grassy knoll guy, but um, Starbucks is a very powerful organization and they squelched a lot of the bad press that came out. So to That's do the okay. research, you're probably best suited looking at um, peer reviewed articles that, that came out because the case study that we've used for this project at Sandy Dugout is probably one of the more pointed things you're going to see that, that mm -hmm. paints a picture of Starbucks kind of flying by the seat of their pants. And um, so essentially there's not a lot that duplicates that type of writing um, where it was either, you know, it's, it might've been in a Forbes magazine from 2014 that um, is no longer in you know, publication, things like that. So if you look for peer reviewed articles, if you do Google Scholar, or, or if you look through the uh, EBSCO site, um, through uh, the Goodwin uh, search engine, even in the LibGuides, there's some materials in the LibGuide that can help you uh, research that. So, but you're not going crazy. There, it is tough to find information on that. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Sal. Is there any way uh, I didn't get, I couldn't download chapter two from the book and I haven't gotten the book yet. I won't get until the weekend. Is there any way that either you or somebody can form me the next unit from the book so I can read it or? So I can actually, if you want, like I can like just sit next to you uh, you're on your nightstand. I'll read it to you each night while you're going to sleep. So <laughs> like, you me too? It'll put you, uh, we'll have to make an appointment with Steven to do that. Um, <laughs> um, I have a very calming voice, Sal. So, um, but I, I can, let me try to upload it from, um, I'll upload the PDF. So is it just chapter two you want? Yeah, because I'm getting the book this weekend, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at, I'll, I'm going to upload that tonight and I'll get it over to you. I'll just put it, I might even just upload it and put it on the, um, on the Canvas page. So you can, I'll just pull the link and put it on the Canvas page so you can access it. Uh, anybody else? I know somebody else, who else is waiting for the book? Rebecca, you ordered it, Joanna. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I think I shared with you, I prefer the book because I, I like to read like the book. I'm not a big e-reader, but, um, you know, it is part of the open education resource that the college has to prevent um, cost of education with these books you know these things are expensive this is a relatively inexpensive textbook as far as books go but you know some of the science classes have like 350 dollars textbooks that are outdated in a semester so it's ridiculous uh, so yeah uh so i will upload that tonight when we finish up here yeah i mean it, even like like in in the my e still an email that'd be even better for me because i'm not even using canvas at the moment okay we'll get it that'd be great Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have anything? So right, as well. of right now, what do we need to do for our groups? Do we need to, was it, we need to give you a team leader or something like that? Identify a team leader. Yeah. Um, and you're really not doing, uh, next week we'll talk about the project that's going to be coming up in week. Or I think you're going to have that week to put together your your proposal of what it's going to look like. So, so um, but nothing that you really need to do with them right now. Just ID a team leader, shoot me an email, let me know who it is, and then that that team leader will submit the um, the rough draft. So so the other two teammates do not have to submit anything that particular week, <clears throat> and then then you all submit that on the final. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate you sticking around with me and uh, I will, uh, I'll see you next week. I will be in class um, unless, you know, I get the Sal version of this thing where I'm dragging for a week, but I hope not. Um,
but otherwise uh, I'll be at, uh, at, at uh, keep keep an eye out on your student email because I got an email from Amory Andrews tonight, the admin over at Penn, and she might be moving us to a different classroom next week. So we were in 109, which if you come in the front door and hang a right or in that corner, um, but uh, so she might be moving us, so stay tuned, but I'll, I'll, I'm sure she'll let me know. Like, you think ASAP. like still the same building? Oh, definitely the same building. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, just like, like this class that I had last semester, I was in 112, which is like a oh, massive okay. classroom, really spread out. Yep. Um, so- Is that the UDL classroom? Yeah, that's UDL. It's got three big screens in it. Pretty sweet. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll let you guys know, but we'll probably, I'll definitely be on ground, maybe in 109, but I'll let you know before next week, obviously. All right, well, thanks everybody. Have a great week. Good luck. Let me know, text, email me if you need anything. I'll get right back to you. And let me know if anybody's thank having any too. tech problems. Hope you're, you feel better. Thank, thank you. Guys. Go Bye, thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. You too.